Great Appalachian Trail from New Hampshire to the Carolinas by Benton McKay. Coffee Break Collection 32, Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Appalachian Trail from New Hampshire to the Carolinas. From the New York Times, February 18, 1923. The Appalachian Trail is a proposed walking or hiking trail to extend through the length of the crest line of the Appalachian chain of mountains, from Maine to Georgia, from northward of Mount Washington in the New Hampshire White Mountains, to southward of Mount Mitchell in the Carolina Highland. The project is one in regional planning. It is being promoted by the American Institute of Architects through its Committee on Community Planning, of which Clarence S. Stein is chairman. The project was first proposed by the present author in the Institute's journal for October 1921. It was discussed in detail at the New York and New Jersey Trail Conference, held in New York last Friday. And if things come to pass as the promoters dare to hope, the building of this trail will be merely the first step in the building of a people's Appalachian Empire. And what excuse do we give for our imperial designs? Why, the same old excuse, outlet. Of surplus population? Perhaps so. The east sides of our cities would suggest the obvious need for highways of expansion. Or is it outlet of surplus soul which we require? The call of the frontier, that twilight zone between what is and what may be, lies deep within us. It is a pent-up volcanic force in every human being. It cries aloud for work, and so it heeds the drumbeat. It cries for play, and so it seeks the dance hall. If surplus population, surplus body, demands its outlet, so does surplus soul. The flowers that bloom in the spring, Trala, have something to do with the case. The outlet which we crave is the one they have attained, to be out in the sun. We would build a place there. Here is the work we crave, to build for ourselves on the frontier a better, a wider place in which to live a wider life. But how shall we approach this stupendous job? Is there some key to our imperial ambition? Geographically speaking, yes. The key to empire is transportation. The railway is the big steel key to a country's industrial development. Its ancient forerunner, the footpath, is the key to a country's recreational development. Our immediate empire is recreational. Our imperial dream, therefore, takes immediate tangible form in the transportation project. An American hinterland. The Appalachian Trail would traverse from north to south, from end to end, the back country of the Atlantic border, the hinterland formed by the Appalachian Range. Other mountainous hinterlands are offered by America, such as the Rocky Mountain and the Cordilleran. But the Appalachian, more than the others, is of national significance, for it penetrates the populous portion of the nation. In climate, resources, peoples, it epitomizes in large degree the American continent. Its area would cut a big slice from the empire of ancient Rome or from that of modern Germany. The gist of empire-making, for the purposes at hand, is the care of the countryside. Herein lies the basis of true patriotism. Why the cry, my country, and not my city or my government? Because these others come and go, but our country stands eternal. It is our common ground and footing. So the biggest material conception which a people is called upon to make is a geographic one. Patria is country, and patriotism is countryism. We hear little of the latter except in time of war. But if our country is worth fighting for in times of war, why is it not worth caring for in times of peace? War patriotism has been advertised, but everyday patriotism has not. Everyday patriotism, the care of the country, is the fundamental principle of empire-making for the people. Forest fire protection. The first care of our country, as the first care of our city or our home, is to keep it from burning up, which means, in this case, forest fire protection. For the Appalachian country, in most part, is a forest country. The forest is, or will be, the main resource. The picturesque grazing industry, both of cattle and sheep, has great possibilities throughout the Appalachian Range. Once a thriving occupation, there are coming signs of its return. But grazing in the upland pastures and agriculture in the bottom valleys 
will by and large be secondary to the great future industry of forestry. So the very first care of the Appalachian country is that of forest fire protection, and in order that the Appalachian Trail and the folk that use it may from the first become an asset and not a liability in such protection, the trail system must be conceived also as a fire system. And this is very simple because the basis of any scheme of forest fire protection consists of forest trails or roads. The first thing needed in forest firefighting is accessibility, the means of reaching the fire. Trails should run along the crest lines and roads along the valleys, these to be connected every little way by counter roads or trails up and down the slopes. The next thing is fire apparatus, picks and shovels, and perhaps extinguishers, cached in big boxes at convenient points along the ways. Having tools in a clear way, all that is needed next is men. Patrollers stationed at strategic lookout points, equipped with map, field glass, and telephone, give the alarm when smoke is first sighted. They call up the local fire warden who lives in the valley or nearby town. He then calls his men together, the firefighters, paid or voluntary, who hold themselves ready to run and go at the drop of the hat. Fire systems of this sort are kept up by the United States Forest Service on all the national forests, several of which are in the Appalachian Mountains. They are also maintained by the various states. Part of the organization of the Appalachian Trail would consist of unifying and extending these forest fire services. This would enlarge and correlate the forest fire prevention work now being developed in cooperation with the various forest officials of state and nation. If fire is the first enemy of the forest country, devastation is the second. But forest devastation is our present American practice. We cut down the forests three times faster than they grow. We treat the forest not as a crop of wood, but as a deposit of wood. And just as we mine the coal deposits below ground, so do we mine the wood deposits above ground. We shovel out the coal and leave the coal mine empty. And we shovel out the timber and leave the forest valley empty. Empty of timber and of a timber industry. Empty of workers and of population. The opposite of forest mining is forest culture or forestry. This cuts from the forest valley each year only as much timber as grows there each year. So the valley never becomes empty of timber, industry, or folks. Forest culture, therefore, is a big principle in empire making. It would restore to the country not only the forests but the folks. Many in Appalachian Hilltown has fewer families today than 100 years ago. It has been wrecked through forest mining. It can be restored through forest culture. The might-be empire of the Appalachian country is a land of hidden treasure. Millions of acres await reclamation, not alone for timber raising, but for sheep and cattle raising, for grazing on the hillsides, and for farming in the valleys. Whole valleys remain empty, which might be alive with thriving communities. The reclamation thus of millions of acres would mean the restoration of thousands of homes. And the approach to a restored east is a continuous highway, as the overland trail was the approach to the opening west. So much for possibilities and aspirations, but empire was ever an elusive dream. How shall we bring it all about? What are the possibilities for making a start, and who shall take the lead? For one thing, the job should not be left wholly to technicians. The forester, the engineer, the architect, the landscape architect, the agriculturist, each has his big part in this development. But there is something even bigger, for without the will to do which comes from the people at large, the technician's hands are tied. The amateur, as a representative of the people, is needed quite as much as the technician. He is needed, not to look on, but to take part, to take his hand in plan and survey. And if he goes astray, the expert can correct. The professional should guide, but the amateur should do. Connect old roots. The first step is to study the work already accomplished. For hundreds of miles, the path is already made for us. Mountain and forest trails of one sort or another riddle the Appalachian Ranges. In large part, therefore, to make the trail will consist of choosing which path to take. Scouting plans are being made along the range to show which paths are best. And, of course, a lot of cutting will have to be done. Trail cutting is an old story to the trail fans in various eastern sections. 
In New England, 2,008 miles of through trails have now been cut. This mileage is less than that of the whole Appalachian Trail, as projected from New Hampshire to Georgia. The expense of these trails is borne by each local organization. The idea of the Appalachian Trail is merely to get people to unify their paths along one big line instead of leaving them to run helter-skelter, and they seem to like the idea. Scouting on the projected line of the Appalachian Trail made unexpected progress during the last summer in sections from New England to Virginia. There are, of course, a thousand and one practical difficulties to be overcome. An important one is the matter of getting permission to cross private lands. For several hundred miles, the trail will be on public land, state or national, and here the problem is solved. On private property, experience has shown that through proper approach and understanding, permission is usually granted. There are exceptions, of course, and certain lands may have to be detoured. The chief reason for refusal is fear of forest fires. It is a reasonable fear, and the answer to it is preparation of the kind described to make the trail a factor of fire protection. The end in view is to open up a realm. To do this requires the development gradually by purchase under the Weeks Law of more national forests. We should have indeed one big national forest, a supranational forest, covering the Appalachian country from end to end. This does not mean that all the forest and mountain land should literally be in federal ownership. Much might be state or town-owned. But enough should be in public hands to make of the Appalachian region a national or people's sphere of influence. Here, in a word, is our campaign. To attain the first two mighty steps toward empire. One, transportation, and two, sphere of influence. An Appalachian trail and a supranational forest. And the empire of our ambition is the realm of the crest line. This is something more than a geographical location. It is an environment. It is the environment not of road and hotel, but of trail and camp. It is human access to the sources of life. And in this access, the camp is as vital as the trail. We cannot truly live within our empire unless we provide for night as well as day. The trail which provides alone for going does not wholly function. Unless it have its wayside shelter camp, it fails to give full access to the country. Underworld and Overworld And the camp, which provides a loan for shelter, does not wholly function. It may give access to the country, but that is only half of the potential power of our realm. Under proper guidance and protection, the recreational power of the day's walk on the trail could be doubled by the evening spent in camp. Herein lies access not only to the country, but to a whole new social life. Down here in the cities, where most of us now live, we have a social life of many patterns. These go by numerous names, such as the club life, and the cafe life, and the tenement life, and whatnot. And we refer to the lot of some of our less fortunate neighbors as the life of the underworld. But in a sense, however respectable our lives may be, the life of all of us folk down here Beneath the mountain basis is a life of the underworld. Hence the obvious need to develop above these mountain bases up in the realm of the crest line a life of a different stratum, a life of the overworld. Thus should our guideboards read. It will be a long, long path, and the Appalachian Trail is only the first link. But it makes a start. The scouting of this trail and the fields to which it leads is something to make for immediate fun as well as ultimate welfare something to stimulate in the public mind a clean-cut vision of constructive national development as against a fog of economic vagaries, something to serve as a constructive outlet for the high-powered spirit of youth, not to absorb energy but to attain a goal, the goal of empire, a better deal, a place in the sun. Such is the outlet sought through the Appalachian Trail. End of Great Appalachian Trail from New Hampshire to the Carolinas Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 2 From the Modern Babes in the Wood, or Summerings in the Wilderness, by H. Perry Smith. Coffee Break Collection 32. Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Perhaps, as we have mentioned, insects, 
a word or two regarding the particular varieties which in this great wilderness most do congregate will not be inappropriate as might be expected the omnipresent mosquito abounds but we as a party always possess something akin to respect for this sleepless little nightingale it is the enemy who steals upon us unawares the thief who comes in the night the assassin who stabs us in her back that we most despise while around the deeds of the bold enemy who confronts us in his own person or the dashing highwayman who politely invites us to loan him our purse a sort of halo of glory arises it is so with the wilderness insects there are four varieties that are most prominent and we will name them respectively as the memory of their persecutions is more or less vivid the least harmless first viz the unterrified mosquito the persistent deer fly the insinuating black fly and that irrepressible quintessence of cussedness the punky this is the order in which we appreciated the assiduity of their attentions others may see or feel the thing in a different light the taste of the blood of different people may affect the palates of these marauders differently and we think it is the case we have seen on racket lake an old superannuated whiskey soak combination of guide trapper and beggar one injection of whose blood into a punky's trunk would make him gutter drunk for one week and sick about the next while perhaps a tough old mosquito might stand under it such a man as that would naturally disagree with us regarding the length of time required by one of each of these different varieties to kill a man but we scorn any interference in our theory and hold to our position the mosquito never stabs you in your back if your coat is thick what we mean is he never comes unheralded his onward march is proclaimed in dulcet tones and he beguiles your ear with music before dining from your juggler he must be a trifle egotistical for he emphatically blows his own horn he is the dandy of his race moreover he evidently understands human nature and the motives of men for he prudently delights you with the crescendo and the diminuendo of his song until if fishing he discovers you with one hand dexterously playing with a noble trout before attempting to land him and with the other grasping a limb thereby steading yourself upon the apex of a great green slippery rock in the rapids with almost human sagacity he takes in the position at a glance he sees if you drop your rod you lose your game and if you loosen your grasp of the limb you will go over the falls he reconnoitres the quiet member that rests upon the limb hovers an instant above it then settles upon a swelling vein as lightly as a snowflake in a lake no vain twitching of your muscles can dislodge him he has secured his position by strategy you stand there resolved to be a martyr rather than risk the loss of your trout while he lances an artery at length having landed your game or lost it you drop your rod and just as the little insect's body swells with your red blood you lift your disengaged hand slowly above his devoted head slowly lower it with deadly aim and slap where he was who can decry the generalship displayed by the mosquito he gained his point or rather possessing the point by nature he succeeded in stabbing you with it the deer fly is a glutton he strikes you in the face and before you realize the fact he is below your cuticle and then nothing can shake him off no nothing he clings to his dinner and receiving his death blow while at his unholy repast he rolls at your feet fortunately they are short-lived the black fly is about as large as a small kernel of wheat he is the most reckless and perhaps the most dreaded and most dangerous of the wilderness insects he gets upon you you hardly know how generally alights upon your garments and then crawls to his feeding place in fact he looks rather buggy sanderson said the black fly reminded him of the good old grayback days of sixty four you scarcely have any intimation of their approach until you feel or see a few drops of blood trickling down your face or hand he is literally a winged assassin like a cow in a garden he destroys more than he eats and for the sake of the small quantity of blood seemingly required to fill him up 
he will bore a hole through your skin as big as his body smother his black head in the absorbance and then like the boy at the molasses cask believes in letting her run there are a few people in this world so blessed that the bite of the black fly does not poison them but they are scarce governor insisted that he was one of the fortunate ones until the second day after we were fairly in the woods let him bite said he it don't hurt me an atom suppose it does draw a little blood it will do me good so he let him bite the first day on arising next morning he appeared to have the goiter in his neck inflammatory rheumatism in his hands and as bernie said was a regular swell head generally it is a peculiarity of the poison and the bite of this insect that in the blood of most persons the inflammation does not follow until some hours after the bite but the punky is the boss in size they are about as big as a drop of fog magnified they are a pair of jaws on wings their bite is instantaneous in fact it is not well settled that they don't bite in a dozen spots at once their jaws go off like nitroglycerin it has been said that nothing is created without a purpose if this statement be true the punky was created to eat they are usually spoken of in the plural number for they go in droves if you feel a bite from one and that if is entirely superfluous you may rest assured you are surrounded the other insects we have mentioned may by the judicious use of gloves hand nets and such gear be kept at bay but punkies governor swears they will fly through birch bark the black fly when preparing to bleed you can be seen the mosquito warns you with his music but punkies can be neither seen nor heard and if they could what would it avail you might could you see them kill an occasional one but their funerals are marvelously well attended they breed any time and are ready for business in fifteen minutes after birth they can drill a hole in a person's skin twice as deep as their own bodies are long in just two-fifths of a second eat a square meal off his blood and get away in another fifth digest it and return hungry during the other two it is thought by some that there must be an instant of time while the punky is tapping your blood vessels when he remains quiet but we met no one who could make oath to it except captain parker at long lake he informed us that he fired twice at what he supposed to be a panther in a tree directly over his head but which further investigation proved to be a punky in his eyebrows we despair of giving an adequate description of the sensations experienced from an attack of a well-regulated family of punkies but it may be likened to a constant shower of fine sharp sand upon one's face each grain of which should be poisoned sufficiently to leave a sting for five minutes there is one element that punkies can't stand that is fire and smoke governor consoles himself with the remark that if he is adjudged as unworthy in the next world he will go where punkies can't live no punkies can't live in thick smoke but the trouble with this remedy is that there are but few men who can live many days and breathe nothing else another much vaunted antidote is a wonderfully nauseous decoction called oil of tar this is the fluid almost universally used by guides and by many sportsmen to drive away punkies personally we never used it but we have seen it and smelled it and we haven't a doubt that it answers the purpose if punkies show any good taste or discrimination it is their unwillingness to suck blood through a coating of that stuff it makes a man smell like the ruins after a fire and his face looks like a smoked shoulder our preventative is one which answers tolerably well and it has the merit of being clean and smelling sweet we speak of the oil of penny royal this mixed into fresh lard and used freely in connection with smudges to clear a tent or shanty before retiring is usually quite effective its worst objection is that its scent is not lasting as a consequence one is sometimes compelled to drop his rod when in the midst of an exciting catch to renew the application now after having written this chapter it occurs to us that perhaps ned in the guidebook hereto appended has given explicit descriptions and remedies for the persecution of these various pests and the thought intrudes itself that maybe some reliable statements may have crept into our remarks on the subject which might be duplicated by him 
perhaps on the whole it will be as well for the reader to skip this chapter entire and seek solid information upon the subject in the appendix after this caution any person rash enough to turn back does so at his own risk end of chapter two from the modern babes in the wood or summerings in the wilderness by h perry smith from basel to bale by johann goethe from letters from switzerland coffee break collection thirty two wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org from basel to bale munster october three seventeen ninety seven from basel you will receive a packet containing an account of my travels up to that point for we are now continuing in good earnest our tours through switzerland on our route to bale we rode up the beautiful valley of the birch and at last reached the pass which leads to this place among the ridges of the broad and lofty range of mountains the little stream of the birch found of old a channel for itself necessity soon after may have driven men to clamber warily and painfully through its gorges the romans in their time enlarged the track and now you may travel through it with perfect ease the stream dashing over crags and rocks and the road run side by side and except at a few points these make up the whole breadth of the pass which is hemmed in by rocks the top of which is easily reached by the eye behind them the mountain chain rose with a slight inclination the summits however were veiled by a mist here walls of rock rose precipitously one above another their immense strata run obliquely down to the river and the road here again broad masses lie piled one over another while close beside stands a line of sharp pointed crags wide clefts run yawning upwards and blocks of the size of a wall have detached themselves from the rest of the stony mass some fragments of the rock have rolled to the bottom others are still suspended and by their position alarm you as also likely at any moment to come toppling down now round now pointed now overgrown now bare are the tops of these rocks among and high above which some single bald summit boldly towers while along the perpendicular cliffs and among the hollows below the weather has worn many a deep and winding cranny the passage through this defile raised in me a grand but calm emotion the sublime produces a beautiful calmness in the soul which entirely possessed by it feels as great as it ever can feel how glorious is such a pure feeling when it rises to the very highest without overflowing my eye and my soul were both able to take in the objects before me and as i was preoccupied by nothing and had no false taste to counteract their impression they had on me their full and natural effect when we compare such a feeling with that we are sensible of when we laboriously harass ourselves with some trifle and strain every nerve to gain as much as possible for it and as it were to patch it out striving to furnish joy and element to the mind from its own creation we then feel sensibly what a poor expedient after all the latter is End of From Basil to Bale by Johann Goethe Call of the Wild Answered by William Macmillan Coffee Break Collection 32 Wilderness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. Call of the Wild Answered The low, squat-looking cedars hung down, overburdened with more than their fair amount of snow. Around each clump of ash and every funny-looking stump, the cold north wind had brushed and whisked the fluffy snow into beautiful little ridges and hollows. The bush was still, with that awesome silence so great in the northern Quebec woods. Though it was only early afternoon, no sun was visible, but in January, who needs bright sun? Certainly not the trapper, for sun kept the wily fur bears basking in its ever-welcome rays. There was a crunch, crunch. The overburdened fur in the far corner of the glade was violently shaken, and there strode into the clearing a husky, well-built man of fifty or thereabouts. Clean-cut and strong, Jean Tremblay, trapper and hunter, cut a splendid figure as he swung on his way over the almost invisible trail, the lift and swing of his snow-covered snowshoes making a dreary, lonesome sound in the wonderful silence. For five hours Jean had been on his trap-line, and he was now nearing the finish of his fifteen-mile walk. That his luck was fair was plain to see, for hanging from his cincture flesh was one dark marten, two fine fishers, one wolf, and five splendid minks. One more trap, then home to the campfire, warmth, and a meal. No matter how long a man has been hunting, no true sportsman can approach a set trap without experiencing some degree of excitement. Thus our friend Jean, though he had hunted and trapped for the best part of his life, drew in his breath and made his way cautiously to his trap. Suddenly a slight sound from that direction made him pause, with one snowshoe in the air. Drawing back a pace, Jean shifted the belt of skins around his waist, tightened his grasp on his gun, and softly crept around the intervening low bushes. And there, securely caught in the cunningly laid trap, was a huge female wolverine, the Devil of the North. Ask any trapper of the far north how many wolverines he has caught, and he will probably tell you stories that will make you gasp. Of tremendous size she was, but caught in the cruel jaws of the powerful trap, her great strength availed her naught. She made an inspiring picture to the delight of Jean as she snarled and growled and tore at her bonds. By her side crouched a small wolverine, no larger than a large-sized cat. It crept close up to its infuriated mother and eyed the man's approach with mild curiosity. Jean made short work of the mother, and after some difficulty secured the little fellow. Resetting the trap, the woodsman continued on his way with the large skin swinging at his belt with the others, and the young animal tucked under his blanket coat. Reaching the cabin, Trembley dropped his belt upon the floor with a sigh of relief, for a spell of mild weather had made snowshoeing difficult. As for the wolverine, he wandered around the small place, making himself at home. True to the reputation of his kind, nosing under everything and in every corner. For of all animals the wolverine is the most marvelously curious. Weeks went by, and Same Carcajou, Carcajou being French for Wolverine, became a great favorite with the neighboring half-breeds in the nearby settlement. To the lonely living woodsman, the Wolverine proved himself a good comrade, often following Jean around like a dog. Night after night, in the long hours, Tremblay would sit with his feet on the top of the little stove, his clay pipe in his mouth, and hold conversation with his odd friend. My mon cher petit enfant, comment avez-vous fait passer la journée? Short summer came and went in mild winter, with its wonderful blanket of white, once more was spread over the land. Sammy had now reached his full growth, and a great beast he was, too, 
measuring a full five feet between the tip of his short black tail and the point of his fine cold snout his thick stout fur coat was a rich brown in color with a marvelous saddle of grave white powerful legs supported his weight and he showed teeth of great whiteness and strength to the dismay of the hunter sammy as the winter advanced once gentle now developed a most vicious and uncertain temper this rapidly grew worse until even jean was nervous whenever he bared his great teeth and the old men of the settlement shook their shaggy heads and muttered that no good ever came from the diable du nord lace fades or christmas went by and the cold january winds blew with more than wanted velocity around the mud-caked cabins of the settlements at the close of one short dreary day nearly in the new year jean making his way home from his trap-line was surprised upon coming in sight of his cabin to see the small window torn away with anger in his heart he strode into the hut for he at once assumed that a thief had broken into his place and robbed him of his toil of all crimes in the north fur stealing is accounted the most despicable for the hunter's catch usually represents all that he has in the world but the sight that met jean's eyes showed him that this was no human marauder pots and pans were overturned furs torn down from the walls and in a mass of straw from the bunk was a fine black fox skin ripped and torn the hunter realized that what he had long dreaded had come to pass the wolverine had heard the call of his native wilds and true to his blood he had gone back to his own but such was the inherent wantonness of the animal it had torn and destroyed everything within reach eventually making his escape through the window which had first attracted the trapper's attention we must leave jean on the edge of his bunk with anger and sorrow in heart surveying the littered floor numerous trap stealings soon notified the countryside of the wolverine's escape trap after trap was cleaned out by this strange animal and naturally tremblay of all trappers suffered the most for a short time secession of hostilities lulled the trappers into fancied security they supposed that after the manner of his kind new hunting grounds had called him suddenly as a bolt from the blue came tidings of the finding by a trap of the torn and mutilated body of joseph perron large wolverine prints in the surrounding snow showed plainly enough that sammy carcajou had taken toll of human life rendered fierce and wild by the intense cold which had kept rabbits to their holes sammy had made eventually a big kill the long rest that followed was when he was supposed to have left the vicinity again being driven out to hunt by hunger he had stalked the unfortunate hunter perron and sprang upon his back as he was bending over a trap deep were the imprecations laid upon the name of the savage wolverine and from that hour every man's hand was turned against him the winter dragged on its weary way and the wolverine still at large worked havoc with the trap lines no trap could nip him no hunter shoot him he was deemed to bear a charmed life but the end was not far off no man swore deeper vengeance than did jean tremblay his former love for his pet had now turned to hate and ever was he on the hunt for the wolverine as he sped on his rounds one cold clear day he suddenly heard a crashing through the bushes of some heavy animal nearer and nearer it came gripping his rifle tightly jean bent down under cover when there suddenly burst into view a large bull caribou wild-eyed panting with fright it dashed here and there in a vain effort to rid itself of some animal perched on his back there with his terrible teeth deep in the heaving shoulders of the caribou was sammy 
Carcajou. Hardly pausing a moment, Jean raised his rifle and fired. The shot was fatal. But so deep were the wolverine's teeth that although the bullet had passed through his brain, he remained on the caribou's back. As the shot rang out, the caribou paused, spread wide his legs, swayed gently, then sank gracefully to the snow, dead. And Sammy's skin, to-day is handled by some furrier in far-off Quebec, who little wrecks of the tragedy which followed the life of the Devil of the Northern Wilds. End of Call of the Wild Answered The Child's Realm by L. H. Bailey Coffee Break Collection 32 Wilderness The Child's Realm A little child sat on the sloping strand, gazing at the flow and the free, thrusting its feet in the golden sand, playing with the waves and the sea. I snatched a weed that tossed on the flood and parted its tangled skeins, I traced the course of the fertile blood that lay in its meshed veins. I told how the stars are garnered in space, how the moon on its course is rolled, how the earth is hung in its ceaseless place as it whirls in its orbit old. The little child paused with its busy hands and gazed for a moment at me, then dropped again to its golden sands and played with the waves and the sea. End of The Child's Realm This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Tele to Udiabe, 70 miles, by General Joffer. Coffee Break Collection 32, Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. From Tele to Udiabe, 70 miles. From Tele, a road leads directly to Sumpi, passing by the ruins of Gardio and by Diartu. This road was then entirely under water, and to take it was out of the question, although it was by far the shortest route. On the other hand, we could not skirt the inundations of the Niger, which were then falling. We should have been constantly kept away from the water by the soft mud left by the river in this region. Furthermore, as the floods spread in the valleys much further out than in the higher parts of the country, long and numerous detours would have been necessary, and the distances would have been considerably lengthened. Besides, these parts are uninhabited, and we could not have found any guide who, taking us straight from one inundation head to the next, might have avoided the many inlets and made the road as short as possible. It was necessary, then, to take the path followed by the natives, which passes by Diura, twenty-five miles away, by the well of Boulavi, twenty-five miles further on, and ends at Udiabe, twenty miles beyond. These three are the only places along the route where there is water. We covered the distance from Tele to Diura, between 4.15 o'clock in the afternoon and 10.30 the next morning, with a rest of seven and a half hours in the ruins of Nya Nya De, where we spent the night. In the village of Diura, there are four wells, which gave us all the water we needed. At Boulavi, there is only one well, 200 feet deep, which, with the means at the traveller's disposal, supplies only 15 litres of water every five minutes. Although we had arrived at 1.40 in the afternoon, and did not leave till 4.15 the next morning, and though water was drawn all night, we could only give the troops and the animals a very small ration of water. As for the porters, they had had no water at all as yet, and to enable them to quench their thirst a little, they were left at the wells after the departure of the column. We now crossed a desolate, nearly desert country, under a burning sun. We arrived at the village of Udiabe, in the canton of Nampala, on the 7th January, at 12.45 in the afternoon, leaving behind several stragglers exhausted with heat and thirst. 
in order that all should have water in sufficient quantity and as soon as possible the troops were divided among the villages of udiabe diavambe nduri one and nduri two which each possessed an abundant well at three o'clock in the afternoon all the troops were settled in camp we then gathered as many porters as we could find tirailleurs who volunteered and natives and dispatched them on the road to Boulavie to carry water to the convoy which we had left there five groups of porters were thus sent between three o'clock in the afternoon and eight the next morning one hundred and fifty porters in all the convoy had left Boulavie on the seventh at twelve thirty p m but being obliged to halt between one thirty and four in the afternoon on account of the great heat by nightfall they had only covered six miles starting again the next morning at six thirty they were able to reach udia Bay at three in the afternoon thanks to the convoys of water which they met at intervals along the road this scarcity of water during a long march in the intense heat fatigued the troops excessively and exhausted a considerable number of porters rest was necessary so the column remained in camp until the tenth this halt was also necessary in order to get a fresh supply of provisions as ours were entirely consumed the troops found sufficient grain for themselves in the villages where they were encamped but from udia Bay to sumpi the first inhabited place we were to reach there would be six long stages and we would therefore have to carry at least six days rations that is nine tons of grain immediately on our arrival ibrahim ahmadi chief of the canton of nampala had been called upon to furnish us with these provisions he was the successor of el hajj buguni former chief of the country who declared himself our enemy and openly allied himself with the tuareg tribe of the kalan tazar with whom he took refuge ibrahima nominated by the commandant of the circle of sokolo had as yet little authority over the village chiefs after trying for twenty-four hours he was obliged to acknowledge his failure to get the provisions and asked for the aid of an armed troop to enable him to fulfil his task a section of our tirailleurs then accompanied him to the various villages of his canton which at the mere sight of our soldiers at once supplied the food we demanded end of from tele to udia Bay, seventy miles chapter twelve the iceberg from the frozen deep by wilkie collins this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanna Schreck. The Iceberg from The Frozen Deep by Wilkie Collins. Alone, alone on the frozen deep, the Arctic sun is rising dimly in the dreary sky. The beams of the cold northern moon mingling strangely with the dawning light clothe the snowy plains in hues of livid gray. An ice field on the far horizon is moving slowly southward in the spectral light. Nearer, a stream of open water rolls its slow black waves past the edges of the ice. Nearer still, following the drift, an iceberg rears its crags and pinnacles to the sky. Here, glittering in the moonbeams, there, looming dim and ghost-like in the ashy light. Midway on the long sweep of the lower slope of the iceberg, what objects rise and break the desolate monotony of the scene? In this awful solitude, can signs appear which tell of human life? Yes, the black outline of a boat just shows itself hauled up on the berg. In an ice cavern behind the boat, the last red embers of a dying fire flicker from time to time over the figures of two men. One is seated, resting his back against the side of the cavern. The other lies prostrate, with his head on his comrade's knee. The first of these men is awake and thinking. The second reclines, with his still white face turned up to the sky, sleeping or dead. Days and days since, these two have fallen behind on the march of the expedition of relief. Days and days since, these two have been given up by their weary and failing companions as doomed and lost. He who sits thinking is Richard Wardour. He who lies sleeping or dead is Frank Aldersley. The iceberg drifts slowly over the black water through the ashy light. Minute by minute the dying fire sinks. 
minute by minute, the deathly cold creeps nearer and nearer to the lost men. Richard Wardour rouses himself from his thoughts, looks at the still white face beneath him, and places his hand on Frank's heart. It still beats feebly. Give him his share of the food and fuel still stored in the boat, and Frank may live through it. Leave him neglected where he lies, and his death is a question of hours, perhaps minutes, who knows? Richard Wardour lifts the sleeper's head and rests it against the cavern's side. He goes to the boat and returns with a billet of wood. He stoops to place the wood on the fire and stops. Frank is dreaming and murmuring in his dream. A woman's name passes his lips. Frank is in England again at the ball, whispering to Clara the confession of his love. Over Richard Wardour's face there passes the shadow of a deadly thought. He rises from the fire. He takes the wood back to the boat. His iron strength is shaken, but it still holds out. They are drifting nearer and nearer to the open sea. He can launch the boat without help. He can take the food and the fuel with him. The sleeper on the iceberg is the man who has robbed him of Clara, who has wrecked the hope and the happiness of his life. Leave the man in his sleep and let him die. So the tempter whispers. Richard Wardour tries his strength on the boat. It moves. He has got it under control. He stops and looks round. Beyond him is the open sea. Beneath him is the man who has robbed him of Clara. The shadow of the deadly thought grows and darkens over his face. He waits with his hands on the boat, waits and thinks. The iceberg drifts slowly over the black water through the ashy light. Minute by minute, the dying fire sinks. Minute by minute, the deathly cold creeps nearer to the sleeping man. And still, Richard Wardour waits. Waits and thinks. End of chapter 12. The Iceberg. From The Frozen Deep. By Wilkie Collins. Recording by Joanna Schreck. Indianapolis. Invasnade by Gerard Manley Hopkins Coffee Break Collection 32 Wilderness Recording by Patrick Wallace Invasnade This darksome burn, horseback brown, His roll-rock high-road roaring down, In coop and in comb the fleece of his foam Flutes, and low to the lake falls home. A wind-puff bonnet of fawn froth turns and dwindles over the broth of a pool so pitch-black fell frowning it rounds and rounds despair to drowning degged with dew dappled with dew are the groins of the braes that the brook treads through wiry heathbacks flitches of fern and the bead-bonny ash that sits over the barn what would the world be once bereft of wet and of wildness let them be left Oh, let them be left, wildness and wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. End of In the Snade. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Midnight Waterloo by William Macmillan. Coffee Break Collection 32. Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. The Midnight Waterloo There is nothing mean about the far northern wilds of Quebec. The very silence of the great north woods breathes, as it were, a feeling of bigness. The lofty mountains rearing their crests on every hand, speak of wonderful distances, of immense valleys and plains, seldom trod by the foot of the white man. None but the native breed knows of the deceptive miles between peak and peak. Weary, back-breaking experience has taught them grim lessons. The very trees have a somberness that seems part of the very atmosphere. The few inhabitants blend their lives with their surroundings, mostly tall, gaunt, and hard-looking. Little laughter or amusement is to be found in a backwood settlement. Somehow even the children seem to 
quickly grow old for their years. The very cabins, strong and massively built, crouched low, as if weighed down by the oppressive stillness of the black, snow-encumbered balsams. Here, in the cold, invigorating grip of a northern climate, where few strangers penetrate, live a strong, hardy lot of French-Canadian bushmen and breeds. With blood as much Scotch as it is Indian, they fight a hard, truceless battle with the great wilderness having to match their wits against the cunning of the little fur-bearers of the bush, many times hunger has knocked at the gaily painted doors of the little homes. This constant battle of wits has developed many good and clever hunters, some perhaps a little more adept than others. Of all the veteran trappers of the settlement, Jean de Bouc was considered the most successful. His long, lonely trips to the far white slopes meant his return heavily laden with the fruits of the traps. Tall and thin, but powerfully built, Jean's sixty winters rested lightly upon the long tousled locks of gray hair that had never felt a comb. In somber solitude he lived in a tumble-down shanty at the far bend of the main trail. To this lonely, humble home there came one sharp frosty evening a pack train, led by a young Sioux from Lac ou Salmon, thirty-one miles due west. Behind the sleigh, which was piled high with sundry provisions, strode three strangers. With a word, the young Indian halted the steaming huskies at the door. The weary travelers were welcomed with all the warmth and good cheer peculiar to the French-Canadian bushman. The primitive latch-string is always out, in this wonderful land of snow. The city men, for such they were, told Jean of the vain quest for big game. Now, considerably discouraged, they were on the point of returning to their starting point, when they came across this stray Indian, who told them of this wonderful hunting on the steep slopes of these great hills. Supper over, boxes were drawn close to the blazing fire of pine knots, pipes were lit, and amid the dancing, flickering shadows upon the tumble-down ceilings, yarns were told and adventures recounted. Jean listened with open-mouthed incredulity to the tales of boats that carried two thousand people, of men who flew in the air and went under the sea in ships, and of the great war of which he had but faintly heard, and of millions of men involved. Poor Jean's simple mind couldn't grasp these tremendous facts at all. The nearest he had ever gotten to civilization was in the spring, when he went down the trail to Lac ou Salmon to dispose of his winter's catch. There he sold his furs, got his money, and as speedily passed it over to the whiskey runners, and came home poorer than when he left, and with but a hazy recollection of what had happened to him. Slowly, under the warmth and comfort of his pipe, the old hunter's tongue loosened, and, slowly at first, he held his hearers spellbound with tales of the wilds, stranger even than many in books. There was no put-on or make-believe about the old fellow. Everything he recounted was with the simple talk of a wholly uneducated man. None of his listeners could express any doubt of the truth of his tales. They were hearing of the tragedies of the North from one who had lived and suffered the privations of the pioneer. Two of the old fellow's listeners sat on upturned biscuit boxes before the crackling flames. The third, a mere slip of a lad, lay comfortably stretched full length upon a great moose skin. While listening to the deep voice of the narrator, this lad kept poking curious fingers into the long, thick hair of his couch. Slowly the warmth of the fire in his tingling moccasin free limbs, the tobacco-poisoned air, and the drone of the voice had its effect, and after a few vain efforts to keep open his wearied eyes, he gently rolled over in sleep. In the next pause loud snores told of a deep, well-earned sleep. Swiftly the spears of the wild free north picked him up in fancy and dropped him in a dense forest miles from the settlement. 
Few were the trails of the smaller wild folk. Nothing but the great hulky bear and lordly moose roamed in the trackless glades. All day he sped upon a heavy, heart-breaking trail. His pack, fairly heavy at the start, now weighed down on his aching back like an everlasting sin. He had hoped before dark to make camp on the highest of the hills in the distance, but darkness was falling rapidly, and he still seemed many miles from his goal. Suddenly, Fatigue, hunger, and distance were forgotten like a flash. Dropping on one knee, his heart thumping in breathless awe, he beheld an immense print in the soft, powdery snow, the track of a gigantic moose. Nearly as big around as his snowshoes, the prints were sunken deep by the tremendous weight of the animal. The tracks came from a low, dense clump of alders on the right, crossed the open trail, and disappeared in the darkness beyond. All the natural instincts of the hunter were strong upon him. He dashed along the still warm trail of the moose, stumbling over logs in the darkness, and tripping over partially buried brush. Two hours of rapid travel, at the good steady pace, brought him closer to his quarry. The prince showed he was quite near to the slow-moving moose, freshly barked twigs and low brush next appeared as the big fellow had no doubt nibbled his supper however no sound broke the silence of the night pausing at a great birch the hunter peeled off a generous piece of the tinder bark and proceeded to make himself a call trumpet settling himself comfortably behind a large broken fir stump he placed his rifle across his knees raised the trumpet to his lips, and sent away into the silent reaches of the black forest the weird, blood-curdling call of the lovelorn cow. Twice and thrice the call floated upon the soft night winds without response. The fourth brought a faint answer from far up the mountain slope. There was wafted down the deep-throated voice of a bull. Another followed close, and in an amazingly short time rumbling roars from the right of the gully bespoke the rapid approach of a king of the north call followed call each nearer than the last as he crashed through the bushes the waiting mortal in the darkness felt a hair rise under his cap and cold shivers chased each other up and down his spine for one panicky moment he almost contemplated flight nearer and nearer the crashing came and suddenly there loomed up a few yards above him a vast black hulk blacker even than the surrounding shadows an enormous bull he seemed to cut off the very air from the shivering man's lungs his courage was down to zero and he could no more have raised his gun than he could open his cracked and parched lips he nearly jumped out of his skin when the great brute sounded out his hoarse, tempting note of passion. Instead of the expected soft low of a cow, a tremendous crashing far down the gully was the only answer. And suddenly a second vast shape reared itself out of the darkness and advanced up the slope. The first bull caught sight of the invader and came down the mountain to meet him. Too late, the hunter realized his frail shelter was fairly between the two angry warriors. The darkness partly hid what was an awesome and wonderful sight. With deep-throated roars the charging monsters met not ten yards from the cowering man. A mighty grinding of many tined antlers was quickly followed by grunting, straining battle. In the darkness the huge bodies appeared vast and unearthly. He could hear the great gasps of mighty lungs. The unwitting author of all this could almost touch the sweating, straining flanks of the frothing demons. The battle progressed. They were swaying across the open glade. The second moose appeared to be budding and shoving his enemy with telling effect. Suddenly a bright northern moon sprang from a mass of cloud with a burst of bright yellow light over the blood-stained snow. At the very instant the bigger bull caught sight of the unfortunate human. 
who in his excitement had leaned too far from his shelter. Quick as a flash, the great beast turned and slashed at the stump with his sharp hooves and horns. Whack! It burst into a thousand pieces and out rolled the man in plain sight of the enraged animals. To turn and lunge, the prostrate kicking figure was but the work of an instant. Luckily the soft snow yielded to the pressure, and the full force of the thrust was lost. Desperately the man flung out his arms and caught the beast about the neck. A sudden jerk of the powerful shoulders flung him full twenty feet away into the thorny embrace of a low mulberry bush. He scrambled to his feet in time to see the huge animal floundering down upon him. The stiff, coarse fur stood up on the arched neck with rage, and the bloodshot eyes rolled in screaming anger. Taking a long chance, the hunter staggered around the bush and sprinted with shaking knees to his rifle. He turned in time to be hurled over with the fury of the next charge. Staggering to one knee, he took hurried aim and pulled the trigger. The heavy bullet stopped the animal for a second. Then he came lumbering down upon his victim. Fifteen yards, ten yards, five, and with a prayer upon his lips, the hunter sent a second messenger of death crashing into the brain of the charging bull. It stopped, spread wide its mighty legs, swayed gently like a stricken tree, and sank heavily to the bloody snow. With a sob of thankfulness, the nerve-broken human awoke to find the fire burnt to ashes, the old trapper asleep on the table, while he himself lay with sweaty, clammy hands sunk deeply into the thick mane of the moose skin on the floor. End of the Midnight Waterloo Excerpt from The Minstrel by James Beattie, 1735 to 1803. Coffee Break Collection 32, Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Excerpt from The Minstrel lo where the stripling wrapped in wonder roves beneath the precipice or hung with pine and sees on high amidst the encircling groves from cliff to cliff the foaming torrents shine while waters woods and winds in concert join and echo swells the chorus to the skies would edwin this majestic scene resign for aught the huntsman's puny craft supplies ah no he better knows great nature's charms to prize and oft he traced the uplands to survey when o'er the sky advanced the kindling dawn the crimson cloud blue main and mountain gray and lake dim gleaming on the smoky lawn far to the west the long long vale withdrawn where twilight loves to linger for a while and now he faintly kens the bounding fawn and villager abroad at early toil but lo the sun appears and heaven earth ocean smile and oft the craggy cliff he loved to climb when all in mist the world below was lost what dreadful pleasure there to stand sublime like shipwrecked mariner on desert coast and view the enormous waste of vapor tossed in billows lengthening to the horizon round now scooped in gulfs with mountains now embossed and hear the voice of mirth and song rebound flocks herds and waterfalls along the hoar profound in truth he was a strange and wayward wight fond of each gentle and each dreadful scene in darkness and in storm he found delight nor less than when on ocean waves serene the southern sun diffused his dazzling sheen even sad vicissitude amused his soul 
and if a sigh would sometimes intervene and down his cheek a tear of pity roll ah sigh a tear so sweet he wished not to control o ye wild groves o where is now your bloom the muse interprets thus his tender thought your flowers your verdure and your balmy gloom i've laid so grateful in the hour of drought why do the birds that song and rapture brought to all your bowers their mansions now forsake ah why has fickle chance this ruin wrought for now the storm howls mournful through the brake and the dead foliage flies in many a shapeless flake where now the rill melodious pure and cool and meads with life and mirth and beauty crowned ah see the unsightly slime and sluggish pool have all the solitary vale embrowned fled each fair form and mute each melting sound the raven croaks forlorn on naked spray and hark the river bursting every mound down the vale thunders and with wasteful sway uproots the grove and rolls the shattered rocks away end of excerpt from the minstrel by james beattie seventeen thirty five to eighteen hundred and three the nameless creek from the book adventures in the wilderness by h h murray this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in May 2020. The Nameless Creek It was five o'clock in the afternoon when, after three hours of constant struggle with the current, we burst our way through a mass of alder bushes and marsh grass, and, behold, the lake lay before us. Wet from head to foot, panting from my recent exertion, having eaten nothing since seven in the morning, and weary from ten hours' steady toil, I felt neither weariness nor hunger as I gazed upon the scene. Shut in on all sides by mountains, mirrored from base to summit in its placid bosom, bordered here with fresh green grass, and there with reaches of golden sand, and again with patches of lilies, whose fragrance mingled with the scent of balsam and pine, filled the air, the lake reposed unruffled and serene. I know of nothing which carries the mind so far back toward the creative period as to stand on the shore of such a sheet of water, knowing that as you behold it, so has it been for ages. The water which laves your feet is the same as that which flowed when the springs which fed it were first uncapped. No rude axe has smitten the forests which grow upon the mountains. Even the grass at your side is as the parent spire, which he who ordereth all commands to bring forth seed after its kind. All around you is as it was in the beginning. I know not how long I should thus have stood musing, but for the motion of John's, which broke the chain of thought and brought my mind back to the practical realization that we were wet, hungry, and tired. In the middle of the lake was a large flat rock, rising some two feet above the surface of the water. Stepping noiselessly into our boat, we paddled to the rock, and wringing our dripping garments, stretched ourselves at full length upon it to dry. Oh, the pleasant sensation of warmth which that hard couch to which the sun had given a genial heat communicated to us! Never was bed of eider down so welcome to royal limbs as was that granite ledge to ours. What luxury to lie and watch the vapor roll up from your wet garments while the warm rock gave out its heat to your chilled body. In an hour we were dry, at least comparatively so, and we held a council. Our commissariat was getting rather low. Our stores spread upon the rock amounted to the following— two pounds of pork, six pounds of flour, four measures of coffee, one half pound of tea. John estimated that this would last us three days, 
if I had ordinary success with the rod. "'But what are we to do tonight?' I exclaimed. "'We have neither trout nor venison, and I am hungry enough to eat those two pounds of pork alone, if I once get fairly at it. And there goes the sun back of the treetops now.' "'Well, unstrap your rod and select your flies,' responded he, "'and we will see what we can find. "'I don't mean to have you wrap yourself around that piece of pork tonight anyway.' "'I did as requested. "'For the tail fly I noosed on a brown hackle, "'above it I tied a killer, "'and for the dapper I hitched on a white moth. "'Taking the bow seat, John paddled straight for the west shore of the lake,' and the light boat, cutting its way through lily pads, shot into a narrow aperture overhung with bushes and tangled grass, and I saw a sight I never shall forget. We had entered the inlet of the lake, a stream some twenty feet in width, whose waters were dark and sluggish. The setting sun yet poured its radiance through the overhanging pines, flecking the tide with crimson patches, and crossing it here and there with golden lanes. Up this stream, flecked with gold and bordered with lilies as far as the eye could reach, the air was literally full of jumping trout. From amid lily pads, from under the overhanging grass, and in the bright radiance poured along the middle of the stream, the speckled beauties were launching themselves. Here a little fellow would cut his tiny furrow along the surface after a fluttering gnat, there a larger one, with quivering fin and open mouth, would fling himself high into the air in a brave attempt to seize a passing moth, and again a two-pounder, like a miniature porpoise, would lazily rise to the surface, roll up his golden side, and flinging his broad tail upward, with a splash disappear. Casting loose my flies and uncoiling my leader, I made ready to cast— but John, unmindful or regardless of the motion, kept the even sweep of his stroke. Round tufted banks, under overhanging pines, and through tangled lily pads we passed, and at every turn and up every stretch of water the same sight presented itself. At length, sweeping sharply round a curve, John suddenly reversed his paddle and checked the boat so that the bow stood upon the very rim of a pool some forty feet across. Dark and gloomy it lay, with its surface as smooth as though no ripple had ever crossed it. No one would have guessed that beneath the tranquil surface lay life and sport. Adjusting myself firmly on my narrow seat, untangling the snails and gathering up my leader, I flung the flies into mid-air and launched them out over the pool. The moment their feathery forms had specked the water, a single gleam of yellow light flashed up from the dark depth, and a trout, closing his mouth upon the brown hackle, darted downward. I struck, and I had him. A small trout he proved to be of only some half-pound weight. After having passed him over to John to be disentangled, I again launched the flies out, which, pausing a moment in mid-air as the straightened line brought them up, began slowly to settle down, but ere they touched the water, four gleams of light crossed the pool, and four quivering forms, with wide-spread tails and open mouths, leaped high out of the water. I struck, and after a brief struggle, landed too. From that moment the pool was literally alive with eager fish. The deep, dark water actually effervesced, stirred into bubbles and foam. Six trout did I see at once in mid-air, in zealous rivalry to seize the coveted flies. Fifteen successive casts were made, and twenty-three trout lay flapping on the bottom of the boat. But of them all none would weigh over three-quarters of a pound. Yet had I seen fish rise, which must have balanced twice that weight. I turned to John and said, "'Why don't some of those large ones take the fly?' presently presently responded he the little ones are too quick for them cast away quick and sharp waste no time snap them off never mind the flies and when you have cleared the surface of the small fry you will see what lies at the bottom i complied 
at last after some forty had been flung down the stream the rises became less frequent the water less agitated and partly to rest my wrist and partly to give john time to adjust new and larger flies i paused in five minutes the current had cleared the pool of bubbles and the dark water settled gradually into sullen repose now said john lengthen your line and cast at that patch of lily pads lying under the hemlock there and if a large one rises strike hard i did as desired the flies in response to the twist of the pliant rod rose into the air darted forward and pausing over the lily pads lighted deftly on the water scarcely had their trail made itself visible on the smooth surface before a two-pounder gleamed out of the dark depths and rolling his golden side up to the light closed his jaws upon the white moth i struck stung by the pain he flung himself with a mighty effort high in the air hoping to fall upon the leader and snap the slender gut dropping the point of my rod he came harmlessly down upon the slack recovering himself he dove to the bottom sulking bearing gradually upon his mouth the only response i got was a sullen shaking as a dog shakes a woodchuck fearing his sharp teeth would cut the already well chafed snell i bore stoutly upon him lifting him bodily up toward the surface when near the top giving one desperate shake he started back and forth round and round that pool he flashed a gleam of yellow light through the dark water until at last wearied and exhausted by his efforts he rolled over upon his side and lay panting upon the surface john deftly passed the landing net under him and the next minute he lay amid his smaller brethren in the boat i paused a moment to admire a bluish black trout he was dotted with spots of bright vermilion his fins, rosy as autumnal skies at sunset, were edged with a border of purest white. His tail was broad and thick, eyes prominent, mouth wide, and armed with briery teeth, a trout in color and build rarely seen, gamey and staunch. Noosing on a fresh fly in place of the one his teeth had mangled, I made ready for another cast. Expecting much, I was not prepared for what followed now all ye lovers of bright waters and green sward who lift a poor half-pounder with your big trolling rod and call it sport listen and learn what befell one of your craft at sunset at the pool of the nameless creek nameless let it be until she who most would have enjoyed it shall on some future sunset floating amid the lilies cast flies upon its tide a backward motion of the tip and a half turn of the wrist and the three flies leapt forward and ahead, spreading themselves out as they reached the limit of the cast, like flakes of feathery snow they settled, wavering downward, when suddenly up out of the depth, cleaving the water in concert, one to each fly, three trout appeared. At the same instant, high in midair, their jaws closed on the barbed hooks. No shout from John was needed to make me strike, I struck so quick and strong that the leader twanged like a snapped bowstring, and the tip of the light rod flew down nearly to the reel. All three were hooked, three trout weighing in the aggregate seven pounds, held by a single hair on a nine-ounce rod, in a pool fringed with lily pads, forty by thirty feet across. Then followed what to enjoy again I would ride thrice two hundred miles. The contest, requiring nerve and skill on the fisher's part, was to keep the plunging fish out of the lily pads, in which, should they once become entangled, the gut would part like a thread of corn silk or a spider's gossamer line. Up and down, to and fro, they glanced, the lith rod bent like a coachman's whip to the unusual strain, and the leader sung as it cut through the water with the whirr of a pointed bullet at last when at the farthest corner of the pool they doubled short upon the line and as one fish rushed straight for the boat fishermen know what that movement means give em the butt give em the butt shouted john smash your rod or stop em never before had i feared to thrust the butt of that rod out toward an advancing fish 
but here were three each large enough to task a common rod untired and frenzied with pain rushing directly toward me if i hesitated it was but an instant for the cry of john to smash your rod or stop em decided the matter gripping the extreme butt with one hand and clutching the reel with the other i held them steadily out toward the oncoming fish Goodbye, old rod i mentally exclaimed and i saw the three gleaming forms dash under the boat staunch as you are you can't stand that an instant and the pressure came upon the reel i gripped it tightly not giving an inch the pliant rod doubled itself up under the strain until the point of the tip was stretched a foot below the hand which grasped the butt and the quivering lancewood lay across the distended knuckles nor fish nor rod could stand that pressure long i could feel the fibres creep along the delicate shaft and the mottled line woven of choicest silk attenuated under the strain seemed like a single hair i looked at john his eyes were fastened upon the rod i glanced down the stream and even at the instant the three magnificent fish forced gradually up by the pliancy of what they could not break broke the smooth surface and lay with open mouths and gasping gills upon the tide in trying to land the three the largest one escaped the other two averaged sixteen inches long within the space of forty minutes nearly a hundred trout had been taken fifty of which varying from one quarter of a pound to two pounds and a half in weight lay along the bottom of the boat the rest had been cast back into the water as unhooked by john it was saturday evening the sun had gone down behind the western mountains and amid the gathering shadows we sought a camp we found one in the shape of a small bark lodge which john himself had erected fourteen years previous when in company with an old trapper he camped one fall upon the shores of this lake kindling a fire in the long neglected fireplace we sat down to our supper under the clear sky already thickly dotted with stars from seven in the morning until eight in the evening we had been without food i have an indistinct recollection that i put myself outside of eleven trout and that john managed to surround nine more but there may be an error of one or two either way for i am under the impression that my mental faculties were not in the best working condition at the close of the meal john recollects distinctly that he cooked twenty-one fish and but three could be found in the pan when we stopped eating which he carefully laid aside that we might take a bite before going to sleep our meal was served up in three courses the first course consisted of trout and pancakes the second course pancakes and trout the third fish and flapjacks end of the nameless creek Chapter One of Mount Rainier, A Record of Explorations, The Mountain Discovered and Named, 1792, by Captain George Vancouver, Royal Navy. Coffee Break Collection 32, Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. Chapter One, Captain George Vancouver, the great English navigator and explorer, lived but forty years, from 1758 to 1798. He entered the British Navy on the Resolution under Captain James Cook in 1771, and was with that even more famous explorer during his second and third voyages from 1772 to 1780. He was placed in command of the Discovery and Chatham in 1791, and sent to the northwest coast of America. On this voyage he discovered and named Puget Sound and many other geographic features on the western coast of America. The portions of his voyage of discovery to the North Pacific Ocean, giving the record of his discovery, naming and exploring the vicinity of Mount Rainier, are taken from volume two of the second edition published in london in eighteen o one pages seventy nine 
118 and 134 through 138. Tuesday, May 8, 1792. The weather was serene and pleasant, and the country continued to exhibit between us and the eastern snowy range the same luxuriant appearance. At its northern extremity, Mount Baker bore by compass north 22 east, the round snowy mountain now forming its southern extremity, and which, after my friend Rear Admiral Rainier, I distinguished by the name of Mount Rainier, bore north 42 east. Saturday, May 19th, 1792. About noon we passed an inlet on the larboard or eastern shore, which seemed to stretch far to the northward but as it was out of the line of our intended pursuit of keeping the continental shore on board i continued our course up the main inlet which now extended as far as from the deck the eye could reach though from the masthead intervening land appeared beyond which another high round mountain covered with snow was discovered apparently situated several leagues to the south of mount rainier and bearing by compass south twenty-two east. This I considered as a further extension of the eastern snowy range, but the intermediate mountains connecting it with Mount Rainier were not sufficiently high to be seen at that distance. Saturday, May twenty-sixth, 1792. Towards noon we landed on a point on the eastern shore, whose latitude I observed to be forty-seven degrees twenty-one minutes, round which we flattered ourselves we should find the inlet take an extensively eastwardly course. This conjecture was supported by the appearance of a very abrupt division in the snowy range of mountains immediately to the south of Mount Rainier, which was very conspicuous from the ship, and the main arm of the inlet appearing to stretch in that direction from the point we were then upon. Here we dined, and although our repast was soon concluded, the delay was irksome, as we were excessively anxious to ascertain the truth, of which we were not long held in suspense. For having passed round the point, we found the inlet to terminate here in an extensive, circular, compact bay, whose waters washed the base of Mount Rainier, though its elevated summit was yet at a very considerable distance from the shore, with which it was connected by several ridges of hills, rising toward it with gradual ascent and much regularity. The forest trees and the several shades of verdure that covered the hills gradually decreased in point of beauty until they became invisible. When the perpetuating clothing of snow commenced, there seemed to form a horizontal line from north to south along this range of rugged mountains, from whose summit Mount Rainier rose conspicuously, and seemed as much elevated above them as they were above the level of the sea, the whole producing a most grand, picturesque effect. The lower mountains, as they descended to the right and left, became gradually relieved of their frigid garment, and as they approached the fertile woodland region that binds the shore of this inlet in every direction, produced a pleasing variety. We now proceeded to the northwest, in which direction the inlet from hence extended and afforded us some reason to believe that it communicated with that under the survey of our other party. This opinion was further corroborated by a few Indians who had in a very civil manner accompanied us some time, and who gave us to understand that in the northwestern direction this inlet was very wide and extensive. This they expressed before we quitted our dinner station, by opening their arms and making other signs that we should be led a long way by pursuing that route. Whereas by bending their arm, or spreading out their hand, and pointing to the space contained in the curve of the arm, or between the forefinger and thumb, that we should find our progress soon stopped in the direction which led towards Mount Rainier. The little respect which most Indians bear to truth, and their readiness to assert what they think is most agreeable for the moment, or to answer their own particular wishes and inclinations, 
induced me to place little dependence on this information, although they could have no motive for deceiving us. About a dozen of these friendly people had attended at our dinner, one part of which was a venison pasty. Two of them, expressing a desire to pass the line of separation drawn between us, were permitted to do so. They sat down by us, and ate of the bread and fish that we gave them without the least hesitation, but on being offered some of the venison, though they saw us eat it with great relish, they could not be induced to taste it. They received it from us with great disgust, and presented it round to the rest of the party, by whom it underwent a very strict examination. Their conduct on this occasion left no doubt in our minds that they believed it to be human flesh, an impression which it was highly expedient should be done away. To satisfy them that it was the flesh of the deer, we pointed to the skins of the animal they had about them. In reply to this they pointed to each other and made signs that could not be misunderstood, that it was the flesh of human beings, and threw it down in the dirt with gestures of great aversion and displeasure. At length we happily convinced them of their mistake by showing them a haunch we had in the boat, by which means they were undeceived, and some of them ate of the remainder of the pie with good appetite. This behavior, whilst in some measure tending to substantiate their knowledge or suspicions that such barbarities have existence, led us to conclude that the character given of the natives of Northwest America does not attach to every tribe. These people have been represented not only as accustomed inhumanely to desire the flesh of their conquered enemies, but also to keep certain servants, or rather slaves, of their own nation, for the sole purpose of making the principal part of the banquet, to satisfy the unnatural savage gluttony of the chiefs of this country, on their visits to each other. Were such barbarities practiced once a month, as is stated, it would be natural to suppose these people, so inured, would not have shown the least aversion to eating flesh of any description. On the contrary, it is not possible to conceive a greater degree of abhorrence than was manifested by these good people, until their minds were made perfectly easy that it was not human flesh we offered them to eat. This instance must necessarily exonerate at least this particular tribe from so barbarous a practice, and, as their affinity to the inhabitants of Nootka and of the sea coast to the south of that place, in their manners and customs admits of little difference, it is but charitable to hope these also, on a more minute inquiry, may be found not altogether deserving such a character. They are not, however, free from general failing attendant on a savage life. One of them, having taken a knife and fork to imitate our manner of eating, found means to secrete them under his garment, but on his being detected gave up his plunder with the utmost good humor and unconcern. They accompanied us from three or four miserable huts near the place where we had dined for about four miles, during which time they exchanged the only things they had to dispose of, their bows, arrows, and spears, in the most fair and honest manner, for hawks' bells, buttons, beads, and such useless commodities. End of chapter 1 of Mount Rainier, A Record of Explorations, The Mountain Discovered and Named, 1792. Running the Rapids by W. H. H. Murray. Coffee Break Collection 32. Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in May 2021. Running the Rapids. 
now for the rapids said john as our boat left the tranquil waters of the lake and sweeping around a huge shelving ledge shot into the narrow channel where the waters converged from either shore were gathering themselves for the foam and thunder below the rapids were three miles in length one stretch of madly rushing water save where at the foot of some long flight or perpendicular fall a pool lay specked with bubbles and flecked with patches of froth the river is paved with rocks and full of boulders amid which the water glides smooth and deep or dashes with headlong violence against them and ever and anon at the head of some steep declivity gathering itself for flight downward it shoots with arrowy swiftness until bursting over a fall it buries itself in the pool beneath at the head of such a stretch of water whose roar and murmur filled the air we ran our boats ashore never until this season had these rapids been run even by the guides and now untried inexperienced against the advice of friends i was to attempt unaided and alone to guide my boat past ledge through torrents and over waterfalls to the still bay below the preparation was simple and soon made i strapped my rifle rod and all my baggage to the sides and bottom of the boat relaced my moccasins and tightened my belt so that in case i stove the shell or failing to keep her steady should capsize her i might take to the water light and have my traps drift ashore with the wreck nevertheless i did not intend that the boat should upset indeed the chances were in my favor oars and boats had been my playthings from a boy and wild indeed must be the current up and across which i could not shoot the shell in which i sat made of forest pine fourteen feet in length sharp as an arrow and weighing but seventy pounds in addition john had given me valuable hints the sum of which might be expressed thus in currents keep her straight look out for underlying rocks and smash your oars before you smash your boat little danger i said to myself of snapping oar blades made of second growth ash and only eight feet from butt to tip yet it was not without some misgivings that i shot my boat out into the swift current and with steady stroke held her on the verge of the first flight of water while i scanned the foam and eddies for the best opening between the rocks to get her through in shooting rapids the oarsman faces downstream in order to watch the currents direct his course and if need be when within his power and danger is ahead to check his flight and choose another course the great thing and the essential thing to learn and do is to take advantage of the currents whirls and eddies so as to sway your boat and pass from this to that side of the rapids easily the agreement was that john should precede me in his boat that i watching his motions and guided by his course somewhat might be assisted in the descent by his experience a good arrangement surely but the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glay as we found before half a mile of the course had been run for my boat being new and light beside less heavily loaded than john's caught at the head of some falls by the swift current darted down the steep decline and entering side by side with a mighty leap the yeasty foam shot out ahead and from that moment led the race to the foot of the rapids but i anticipate thus as i said i sat in my boat holding her steadily by strength of oar in midstream where the water smoothed itself for the plunge until john with friend burns sitting upon his feet like a turk on the bottom of the boat holding on to either side with his hands to steady himself whether john had strapped him down or not i can't surely say pushed from shore and taking the current above brushed swiftly by with the injunction to follow i obeyed down we glided past rock and ledge swerving now this side and now that sweeping round giant boulders and jutting banks down under the dark balsams and overhanging pines the suction growing stronger and stronger the flight swifter until the boats like eagles swooping on one prey took the last stretch almost side by side 
and lifted high up on the verge of the first falls made the wild leap together and disappeared into the yeasty foam whence rising buoyantly uplifted by the swelling water shot out of the foam and mist and like birds fresh from sport floated cork-like on the pool below we paused a moment to breathe when looking up the two remaining boats guided by jerry and the younger robinson bearing southwick and everett as passengers came sweeping round the curve and rushing as from the roof of a house to the brink of the fall flung themselves into the abyss and in a moment lay along our side the excitement was intense no words can describe the exhilaration of such a flight it was thought after mature deliberation by the company that everett's delighted yell alone in ordinary weather with a little wind in its favor might have been heard easily sixteen miles his whole being corporal and spiritual seemed to resolve itself into one prolonged howl of unmitigated happiness having rested ourselves we started again by this time brief as the experience had been i had learned much as to the action of currents and was able to judge pretty correctly how low a rock or ledge lay under water by the size and motion of the swirl above it one learns fast in action and fifteen minutes of actual experience amid rapids does more to teach the eye and hand what to do and how to do it than any amount of information gathered from other sources to sit in your light shell of a boat in mid-current with rocks on either side where the bed of the river declines at an angle of thirty degrees knowing that a miscalculation of the eye a misstroke of the oar or the least shaking of the muscles will send your boat rolling over and over and you under it has a very strong tendency to make a man look sharp and keep his wits about him well as i said we started for some fifty rods the current was comparatively smooth and slow the river was wide and the decline not sharp the chief difficulty we found to be in avoiding the stones and rocks with which the bottom of the river is paved and which in many places were barely covered my boat with only myself in it needed but some two inches of water to float in and would pass safely over where the other boats would touch or refuse to go at all it required great care on the part of the guides to let theirs over gently as their bottoms are but little thicker than pasteboard and held by small copper tacks at last the shallows were passed and bringing our boats in line one behind the other we made all ready for another rush the sight from this point was grand our boats were poised as on the ridge board of a house while below for some twenty rods the water went tearing down now gliding over a smooth shelving ledge with the quick tremulous motion of a serpent and now torn to shreds by jagged rocks at the bottom and again beat back by huge boulders which lifted themselves in mid-current presenting to the eye one continuous stretch of mad turmoil and riot at the foot of the reach the eye could just discern the smooth glassy rim of a fall we knew not how high while far down the river shut from view by a sharp curve the rush and roar of other falls rose sullenly up through the heavy pines and overhanging hemlocks which almost arched the current from side to side at a word from john who leading the van sat as a warrior might sit his steed bare-headed and erect the oars were lifted and the freed boats as though eager for flight started downward away away they flew if before they went like birds they went like eagles now no keeping in line here each man for himself in this wild race and woe to boatman and to boat if an oar should break or oar bolt snap close after john gaining at every rush my light boat sped no thought for others all eye and nerve for self with a royal upleaping of blood as my face wet with the spray clove through the air i flashed until the fall was reached and side by side with trailing oars we took the leap together down down we sank into the feathery foam the froth flung high over us as we splashed into it 
down down as if the pool had no bottom we went our boats half full of spume and foam till the reacting water underneath caught the light shells up and flung them out of the yeast and mist dripping inside and out from stem to stern as sea-birds rising from a plunge no stop nor stay for breathing here around the curve by no effort of mine leading the race i went swept down another reach and over another fall and without power to pause a moment entered into the third before i had time to think steeper than all behind it lay before me but straight and for a distance smooth for aught i could see as i shook the spray from my eyes until it narrowed and the converging torrent met between two overhanging rocks in one huge ridge of tossing swelling water what lay below i knew not how steep the fall or on what bottom i should land in rapids john had told me the wildest water was the safest and so i steered straight for the highest swell of water and the whitest foam fancy a current rods in width converging as it glides until a mass of rushing water is brought as into an eaves trough five feet across with sharp jutting rocks for sides where the compressed water flings itself wildly up indignant at the restraint put upon it and then fancy yourself in a boat weighing but seventy pounds gliding down with a swiftness almost painful into the narrow funnel through which bursting you must shoot a fall you cannot see but whose roar rises heavily over the dash of the torrent and you can realize what it is to shoot the rapids of the raquette river and my position at the time balancing myself nicely on the seat dipping the oar blades until the lower edges brushed along the tide i kept my eyes steadily upon the narrow aperture and let her glide nothing but the pressure of the air upon the cheek as the face clove it and the sharp whistling of the seething current bespeaks the swiftness with which you move when near the narrow gorge which you must take square in the centre and in direct line or smash your boat to flinders while the width would yet allow wishing some steerage way before i entered the chasm i threw my whole strength upon the oars the lithe ash bent to the strain and the boat quivered from stem to stern under the quick stroke then bending forward upon the seat with oars at a trail i shot into the opening between the rocks for an instant the oar blades grated along their sides and then riding upon the crest of a wave i passed out of the damp passage and lo the fall whose roar i had heard yawned just beneath me quick as thought i swung the oars ahead and as the billow lifted me high up upon the very brink gave way with all my might whatever spare strength i had lying anywhere about me at that particular point of time i am under the impression was thrown into those oar blades the boat was fairly lifted off the wave and shot into the air for an instant it touched neither water nor foam then dropped into the boiling cauldron another stroke and it darted out of the seething mass with less than a gallon of water along the bottom the rapids were run wiping the sweat from my face and emptying the water from the barrels of my rifle i rested on my oars to see the boys come down oh royal sight it was to see them come one after another john leading the van over the verge as boats in air they seemed with airy boatmen as they came dashing along oh royal sport to see them glide like arrows down the steep at an angle so sharp that i could see the bottom board in each boat from stem to stern oh noble sight to see them enter in between the mighty rocks the chasm shutting them from view a moment from which emerging in quick succession with mighty leaps quivering like sporting fish they shot the falls triumphantly what sports have we in house and city like those which the children of wood and stream enjoy heroic sports which make heroic men sure i am that never until we four have done with boats and boating and under other pilotage have entered into and passed through the waters of a colder stream shall we forget the running of the raquette rapids on that bright summer day and often as we pause a moment from work above the harsh rumble of car and cart the sound of file and hammer rises the roar of the rapids 
and often through the hot smoky air of town and city to cool and refresh us will drift from the far north the breeze that blows forever on the raquette rich with the odors of balsam and of pine that night i slept upon the floor at palmer's proud to feel that i was the first gentleman in the language of the gods that ever ran the rapids prouder of that than of deeds attempted or done of which most men would longer dream i nearly forgot to state that several unearthly yells in the chamber overhead during the night revealed the fact that somebody in dreams was still running the rapids end of running the rapids Excerpt from The Solitudes of Nature by William Roundsville Alger, 1822-1905. Coffee Break Collection 32, Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Excerpt from Solitudes of Nature gregariousness and solitariness at the first glance every form of being appears to be social all the world gregarious the trees interlace their branches and wave their tops in multitudinous union from the equator to the poles the waves shoulder their fellows glistening with innumerable smiles whole orchards of apple blossoms blush in correspondence in regiments the ranks of corn laugh on the slopes ponds of lilies uncover their bosoms to the moon meadows of grass blades bend before the breeze and the barley rustles millions of beards together on the lee shoals of herring solidify acres of the sea with moving life infinitudes of phosphorescent organisms covering the surface of the deep turn its heaving field of darkness into a sheet of fire there are ant hills animated cities whose inhabitants outnumber jeddo and peking villages of beavers build in company shaggy hosts of bisons shake the globe with the dull thunder of their tread herds of antelope are seen crowding the entire horizon with their graceful forms the naturalist in the tropics sometimes beholds clouds of gorgeous butterflies miles in width flying past him overhead all day captain flinders saw on the coast of van diemen's land a flight of sooty petrels in a stream which as he calculated contained a hundred million audubon while crossing the kentucky barrens in eighteen hundred and thirteen journeyed for three days beneath a flock of passenger pigeons which according to his careful estimate formed an oblong square a mile in breadth and a hundred and eighty miles in length and included more than a billion of birds moving firmaments of locusts hide the heaven and darken the earth and what mathematics will compute the sum of the insects that toil in the erection of a coral reef everywhere then we see nature collecting her products sands on the shore leaves in the wood fields of flowers aggregations of mountains firmaments of stars swarms of insects flocks of birds herds of beasts crowds of persons life would thus seem to be attractive the enemy of isolation huddling its subjects into social closeness from heaps of mites to tribes of men but after all these phenomena are exceptional and the inferences delusive there is more loneliness in life than there is communion the solitudes of the world outmeasure its societies if consciousness sometimes draws it has its poles of repulsion as well and much of that which looks like fellowship is really but an amassment of separations what sociality is there in compact leagues of animal cule? each one shut in his incommunicative cell might as well have the solar system to himself the higher we look on the scale of strength and individuality the more isolated we see that the nature and habits of creatures are the eagle chooses his airy in the bleakest solitude 
the condor affects the deserted empyrean the leopard prowls through the jungle by himself the lion has a lonely lair so with men while savages like the hottentots gibber in their cradles and among civilized nations the dissipated and the frivolous collect in clubs and assemblies dreading to be left in seclusion the poet loves his solitary walk the saint retreats to be closeted with god and the philosopher wraps himself in immensity preparatory to fixing attention on the various forms of the loneliness of human life a contemplation of some of the gigantic solitudes of nature may envelop the soul in a befitting atmosphere of sentiment the solitude of the desert as we advance into the solitude of the desert not an animal not an insect breaks the perfect silence not a tree or a shrub varies the interminable monotony of sand over the arid and level floor you may sweep the circumference of vision with a glass and not behold a moving speck only when here and there a bleached skeleton peers out of the drift solitude seems to find a speechless voice in death and mutely to proclaim its sway at noon in the glaring furnace the eye faints to see the air incessantly quiver with heat and night when it comes broods chill and still under the low arched sky sparkling with magnificent stars the solitude of prairie the solitude of the prairie is wonderful day after day from morning till evening the traveller journeys forward wearing the horizon as a girdle without seeming to change his spot for the immense circuit of which he is the centre appears to move with him an ocean of grass around an immitigable gulf of azure above he feels as if he stood on the top of the world the circular sharp-cut level of an inverted cone upon which the bulging dome of heaven shuts down in accurate adjustment he looks around the unvarying wilderness of verdure and it seems as if the whole universe were that and there was nothing beside the solitude of the ocean though civilized man has grown more familiar with the ocean it is none the less a solitude how melancholy is its ceaseless wash how lonely its perpetual swing without a comrade in its convulsion or its calm how beneath the immense stoop of naked sky within the blue walls of air in illimitable fluctuation it stretches away from the stagnation of the weedy gulf in one direction to where winter locks its moaning billows in silence to the polar cliffs in the other direction to where its cataracts of surf crash on the indian coast everywhere out of sight of land its spirit and expression are solitary awful scornfully exclusive of sympathy perched alone on the masthead gazing on the unbroken horizon how inexpressibly little a man feels himself to be whether he contemplates the unity of the ship frail speck on the fearful abyss the unity of the overarching heaven the unity of weltering desolation around or the unity of mystery enveloping all it awakens an appalling sense of loneliness end of excerpt from the solitudes of nature by william roundsville alger published in eighteen sixty seven The Song of the Waters by William Murray Graydon. Coffee Break Collection 32 Wilderness. The Song of the Waters. It was midnight on the water by fair Susquehanna's shore. Floating dimly down the distance came the rapid, sullen roar, and the campfire's smouldering embers threw a faint and ruddy gleam on our tent amid the pine trees on the sparkling, moonlit stream i was sleepless 
and the beauty of the radiant starlit night drew me down beside the water with an unresistful might on the farther shore the mountains and the heavens seemed to meet and their deep empurpling shadows stained the current at my feet sweet and faintly sang the waters soft they murmured over the stones and their music seemed to whisper in the sweetest faintest tones i am ancient very ancient i am aged if a day and the centuries piled on centuries will attest me what i say i could sing of trackless forests never trod by foot of man of the beasts and birds that loved me through their brief and earthly span i could tell of newer ages when the red men trod the shore when the war whoop's piercing echo rang above the rapids roar i could sing of wire losing and her brave moravian men of the village that they founded far from haunts of mortal ken and of standing stone the mighty close by wysock's rocky shore bronzed and grey with countless ages rich in legendary lore i could tell of war and treachery of the tomahawk and knife of the tory and the settler and their sharp and bloody strife i could sing of fierce queen esther and the rock that bears her name of sweet gertrude of wyoming she of old historic fame i could sing of love and pleasure i could tell of grief and pain in the centuries that have flourished that can never come again but my duties call me onward i can here no longer bide i must haste to lave my ripples in the ocean's briny tide then the fretful babbling current drowned the river's rhythmic tone and the waters seemed to murmur i am going i am gone and the moonbeam's silvery halo danced on river rock and shore and again the forest echoed to the rapids sullen roar end of the song of the waters recording by sonia this librivox recording is in the public domain the stikeen river by john muir coffee break collection 32 wilderness this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Shemp. The Stikine River. The most interesting of the short excursions we made from Fort Wrangell was the one up the Stikine River to the head of steam navigation. From Mount St. Elias, the coast range extends in a broad lofty chain beyond the southern boundary of the territory gashed by stupendous canyons each of which carries a lively river though most of them are comparatively short as their high sources lie in the icy solitudes of the range within forty or fifty miles of the coast a few however of these foaming roaring streams the alsek chilkat chilkoot taku stikine and perhaps others head beyond the range with some of the southwest branches of the mackenzie and the yukon the largest side branches of the main trunk canyons of all these mountain streams are still occupied by glaciers which descend in showy ranks their messy bulging snouts lying back a little distance in the shadows of the walls or pushing forward among the cottonwoods that line the banks of the rivers or even stretching all the way across the main canyons compelling the rivers to find a channel beneath them the stikeen was perhaps the best known of the rivers that cross the coast range because it was the best way to the Mackenzie River Kaziar gold mines. It's about 350 miles long and is navigable for small steamers 150 miles to Glenora and sometimes to Telegraph Creek, 15 miles farther. It first pursues a westerly course through grassy plains darkened here and there with groves of spruce and pine. Then curving southward and receiving numerous tributaries from the north, it enters the coast range and sweeps across it through a magnificent canyon three thousand to five thousand feet deep and more than a hundred miles long the majestic cliffs and mountains forming the canyon walls display endless variety of form and sculpture and are wonderfully adorned and enlivened with glaciers and waterfalls while throughout almost its whole extent 
the floor is a flowery landscape garden like yosemite the most striking features are the glaciers hanging over the cliffs descending the side canyons and pushing forward to the river greatly enhancing the wild beauty of all the others gliding along the swift flowing river the views change with bewildering rapidity wonderful too are the changes dependent on the seasons and the weather in spring when the snow is melting fast you enjoy countless rejoicing waterfalls the gentle breathing of warm winds the colors of the young leaves and flowers when bees are busy and wafts of fragrance are drifting hither and thither from miles of wild roses clover and honeysuckle the swaths of birch and willow on the lower slopes following the melting of the winter avalanche snowbanks the bossy cumuli swelling in white and purple piles upon the highest peaks gray rain clouds wreathing the outstanding brows and battlements of the walls and the breaking forth of the sun after the rain the shining of the leaves and streams and crystal architecture of the glaciers the rising of fresh fragrance the song of happy birds and the serene colored grandeur of the morning and evening sky in summer you find the groves and gardens in full dress glaciers melting rapidly under sunshine and rain waterfalls in all their glory the river rejoicing in its strength young birds trying their wings bears enjoying salmon and berries all the life of the canyon brimming full like the streams in autumn comes rest as if the year's work were done the rich hazy sunshine streaming over the cliffs calls forth the last of the gentians and goldenrods the groves and thickets and meadows bloom again as their leaves change to red and yellow petals the rocks also and the glaciers seem to bloom like the plants in the mellow golden light and so goes the song change succeeding change in sublime harmony through all the wonderful seasons and weather my first trip up the river was made in the spring with the missionary party soon after our arrival at wrangell we left wrangell in the afternoon and anchored for the night above the river delta and started up the river early next morning when the heights above the big stikeen glacier and the smooth domes and copings and arches of solid snow along the tops of the canyon walls were glowing in the early beams we arrived before noon at the old trading post called bucks in front of the stikeen glacier and remained long enough to allow the few passengers who wished a nearer view to cross the river to the terminal moraine the sunbeams streaming through the ice pinnacles along its terminal wall produced a wonderful glory of color and the broad sparkling crystal prairie and the distant snowy fountains were wonderfully attractive and made me pray for opportunity to explore them of the many glaciers a hundred or more that adorn the walls of the great stikeen river canyon this is the largest it draws its sources from snowy mountains within fifteen or twenty miles of the coast pours through a comparatively narrow canyon about two miles in width in a magnificent cascade and expands in a broad fan five or six miles in width separated from the stikeen river by its broad terminal moraine fringed with spruces and willows around the beautifully drawn curve of the moraine the stikeen river flows having evidently been shoved by the glacier out of its direct course on the opposite side of the canyon another somewhat smaller glacier which now terminates four or five miles from the river was once united front to front with the great glacier though at first both were tributaries of the main stikeen glacier which once filled the whole grand canyon after the main trunk canyon was melted out its side branches drawing their sources from a height of three or four to five or six thousand feet were cut off and of course became separate glaciers occupying cirques and branch canyons along the tops and sides of the walls the indians have a tradition that the river used to run through a tunnel under the united fronts of the two large tributary glaciers mentioned above which entered the main canyon from either side and that on one occasion an indian anxious to get rid of his wife had sent her adrift in a canoe down through the ice tunnel expecting that she would trouble him no more but to his surprise she floated through under the ice in safety all the evidence connected with the present appearance of these two glaciers indicates that they were united and formed a dam across the river after the smaller tributaries had been melted off and had receded to a greater or lesser height above the valley floor the big stikeen glacier is hardly out of sight ere you come upon another that pours a majestic crystal flood through the evergreens while almost every hollow and tributary canyon contains a smaller one the size of course varying with the extent of the area drained 
some are like mere snowbanks others with blue ice apparent depend in massive bulging curves and swells and graduate into the river-like forms that maze through the lower forested regions and are so striking and beautiful that they are admired even by the passing miners with gold dust in their eyes thirty-five miles above the big sticking glacier is the dirt glacier the second in size its outlet is a fine stream abounding in trout on the opposite side of the river there is a group of five glaciers one of them descending to within a hundred feet of the river near glenora on the northeastern flank of the main coast range just below a narrow gorge called the canyon terraces first make their appearance where great quantities of moraine material have been swept through the flood choked gorge and of course outspread and deposited on the first open levels below here too occurs a marked change in climate and consequently in forests and general appearance of the face of the country on account of destructive fires the woods are younger and are composed of smaller trees about a foot to eighteen inches in diameter and seventy-five feet high mostly two-leaved pines which hold their seeds for several years after they are ripe the woods here are without a trace of those deep accumulations of mosses leaves and decaying trunks which make so damp an unclearable mass in the coast forests whole mountainsides are covered with gray moss and lichens where the forest has been utterly destroyed the riverbank cottonwoods are also smaller and the birch and contorta pines mingle freely with the coast hemlock and spruce the birch is common on the lower slopes and is very effective its round leafy pale green head contrasting with the dark narrow spires of the conifers and giving a striking character to the forest the tamarack pine or black pine as the variety of p contorta is called here is yellowish green in marked contrast with the dark lichen draped spruce which grows above the pine at a height of about two thousand feet in groves and belts where it has escaped fire and snow avalanches there is another handsome spruce hereabouts picea alba very slender and graceful in habit drooping at the top like a mountain hemlock i saw fine specimens a hundred and twenty-five feet high on deep bottom land a few miles below glenora the tops of some of them were almost covered with dense clusters of yellow and brown cones we reached the old hudson's bay trading post at glenora about one o'clock and the captain informed me that he would stop here until the next morning when he would make an early start for wrangell at a distance of about seven or eight miles to the northeastward of the landing there is an outstanding group of mountains crowning a spur from the main chain of the coast range whose highest point rises about eight thousand feet above the level of the sea and as glenora is only a thousand feet above the sea the height to be overcome in climbing this peak is about seven thousand feet though the time was short i determined to climb it because of the advantageous position it occupied for general views of the peaks and glaciers of the east side of the great range although it was now twenty minutes past three and the days were getting short i thought by rapid climbing i could reach the summit before sunset in time to get a general view and a few pencil sketches and make my way back to the steamer in the night mr young one of the missionaries asked permission to accompany me saying that he was a good walker and climber and would not delay me or cause any trouble i strongly advised him not to go explaining that it involved a walk coming and going of fourteen or sixteen miles and a climb through brush and boulders of seven thousand feet a fair day's work for a seasoned mountaineer to be done in less than half a day and part of a night but he insisted he was a strong walker could do a mountaineer's day's work in half a day and would not hinder me in any way well i have warned you i said and will not assume responsibility for any trouble that may arise he proved to be a stout walker and we made rapid progress across a brushy timbered flat and up the mountain slopes open in some places and in others thatched with dwarf firs resting a minute here and there to refresh ourselves with huckleberries which grew in abundance in open spots about half an hour before sunset when we were near a cluster of crumbling pinnacles that formed the summit i had ceased to feel anxiety about the mountaineering strength or skill of my companion and pushed rapidly on in passing around the shoulder of the highest pinnacle where the rock was rapidly disintegrating and the danger of slipping was great i shouted in a warning voice be careful here this is dangerous mr young was perhaps a dozen or two yards behind me but out of sight i afterwards reproached myself for not stopping and lending him a steadying hand and showing him the slight footsteps i had made by kicking out little blocks of the crumbling surface instead of simply warning him to be careful 
only a few seconds after giving this warning i was startled by a scream for help and hurrying back found the missionary face downward his arms outstretched clutching little crumbling knobs on the brink of a gully that plunges down a thousand feet or more to a small residual glacier i managed to get below him touched one of his feet and tried to encourage him by saying i am below you you are in no danger you can't slip past me and i will soon get you out of this he then told me that both of his arms were dislocated it was almost impossible to find available footholds on the treacherous rock and i was at my wit's end to know how to get him rolled or dragged to a place where i could get about him find out how much he was hurt and away back down the mountain after narrowly scanning the cliff and making footholds i managed to roll and lift him a few yards to a place where the slope was less steep and there i attempted to set his arms i found however that this was impossible in such a place i therefore tied his arms to his sides with my suspenders and necktie to prevent as much as possible inflammation from movement i then left him telling him to lie still that i would be back in a few minutes and that he was now safe from slipping i hastily examined the ground and saw no way of getting him down except by the steep glacier gully after scrambling to an outstanding point that commands a view of it from top to bottom to make sure that it was not interrupted by sheer precipices i concluded that with great care and the digging of slight footholds he could be slid down to the glacier where i could lay him on his back and perhaps be able to set his arms accordingly i cheered him up telling him i had found a way but that it would require lots of time and patience digging a footstep in the sand or crumbling rock five or six feet beneath him i reached up took hold of him by one of his feet and gently slid him down on his back placed his heels in the step then descended another five or six feet dug heel notches and slid him down to them thus the whole distance was made by a succession of narrow steps at very short intervals and the glacier was reached perhaps about midnight here i took off one of my boots tied a handkerchief around his wrist for a good hold placed my heel in his armpit and succeeded in getting one of his arms into place but my utmost strength was insufficient to reduce the dislocation of the other i therefore bounded closely to his side and asked him if in his exhausted and trembling condition he was still able to walk yes he bravely replied so with a steadying arm around him and many stops for rest i marched him slowly down in the starlight on the comparatively smooth unassured surface of the little glacier to the terminal moraine a distance of perhaps a mile crossed the moraine bathed his head at one of the outlet streams and after many rests reached a dry place and made a brush fire i then went ahead looking for an open way through the bushes to where larger wood could be had made a good lasting fire of resiny silver fir roots and a leafy bed beside it i now told him that i would run down the mountain hasten back with help from the boat and carry him down in comfort but he would not hear of my leaving him no no he said i can walk down don't leave me i reminded him of the roughness of the way his nerve-shaken condition and assured him i would not be gone long but he insisted on trying saying on no account whatever must i leave him i therefore concluded to try to get him to the ship by short walks from one fire and resting place to another while he was resting i went ahead looking for the best way through the brush and rocks then returning got him on his feet and made him lean on my shoulder while i steadied him to prevent his falling this slow staggering struggle from fire to fire lasted until long after sunrise when at last we reached the ship and stood at the foot of the narrow single plank without side rails that reached from the bank to the deck at a considerable angle i briefly explained to mr young's companions who stood looking down at us that he had been hurt in an accident and requested one of them to assist me in getting him aboard but strange to say instead of coming down to help they made haste to reproach him for having gone on a wild goose chase with muir these foolish adventures are well enough for mr muir they said but you mr young have a work to do you have a family you have a church you have no right to risk your life on treacherous peaks and precipices the captain nate lane son of senator joseph lane had been swearing in angry impatience for being compelled to make so late a start and thus encounter a dangerous wind in a narrow gorge and was threatening to put the missionaries ashore to seek their lost companion while he went on down the river about his business but when he heard my call for help he hastened forward and elbowed the divines away from the end of the gangplank shouting in angry irreverence oh blank this is no time for preaching don't you see the man is hurt 
he ran down to our help and while i steadied my trembling companion from behind the captain kindly led him up the plank into the saloon and made him drink a large glass of brandy then with a man holding down his shoulders we succeeded in getting the bone into its socket notwithstanding the inflammation and contraction of the muscles and ligaments mr young was then put to bed and he slept all the way back to wrangell in his mission lectures in the east mr young oftentimes told this story i made no record of it in my notebook and never intended to write a word about it but after a miserable sensational caricature of the story had appeared in a respectable magazine i thought it but fair to my brave companion that it should be told just as it happened End of the Stikeen River The West by Francis Borton Coffee Break Collection 32 Wilderness Recording by Newgate Novelist The West Along our blue Sierra's wall No mouldering castles rest but there the red man's thunderbird hath built his lonely nest no hoary dungeons foul with crime oppress the good clean sod where live oaks meet with knotted arms the blazing bolts of god instead of doubtful titles stamped on pride's dim vellumed page the sullen grizzly here hath left the claw marks of his rage no silken halls no softness here no courtiers false as hell but from the echoing granite gorge the panther's deadly yell here laws unflattering primal harsh the desert's scorching breath here thorn fang claw and scalping knife the crimson trail of death and what are man-made kings and courts with cheap brief honours set where in the red raw clay of things god's thumbprints yet are wet amid these awful solitudes with skies so still and blue are held such deadly fierce debates as minstrels never knew here howling winds of ocean meet the wild winds of the sky while vast dim shapes from desert wastes their spirals wheel on high cliff calls to cliff the avalanche replies in thunders loud while shafts of blinding lightning split the swirling inky cloud that bursts and ploughs the mountains down the salt plains hissing sands till fresh torn canyon gulfs reveal earth's granite swaddling bands and here are men sons of thy strength o oh, western land of mine gay tender careless swift and wild but upright as the pine serene clear-eyed of spartan speech the breed of men out here who've trailed with hunger thirst and death but never met with fear the wide free winds are in their hearts the deep-voiced torrents roar the solemn stillness of the woods beside the lonely shore they need no finger posts for faith no self sure go between they look god in the face and smile their rugged hearts are clean they pluck the grey wolf from his den they tire the grizzly down or peacefully their harvests reap along the foothills brown they beat the mountain into dust they burst its ribs apart their laughter rings homeric when they clutch its golden heart alone they win the chill still heights by mountain sheep untrod they gaze abroad they bare their brows and shout hurrah for god 
oh little folk who cringe and hedge who cannot understand they tread a broader trail than yours across our sunset land where man is kin to peak and star the wide plains lonely space where oft they ride so close to god they meet him face to face end of the west this librivox recording is in the public domain why i go to the wilderness an excerpt from adventures in the wilderness or camp life in the adirondacks by w h h murray published in eighteen sixty nine coffee break collection thirty two wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in May 2021. Why I Go to the Wilderness The Adirondacks Wilderness, or the North Woods, as it is sometimes called, lies between the lakes George and Champlain on the east and the river St. Lawrence on the north and west. It reaches northward as far as the Canada line and southward to Boonville its area is about that of the state of connecticut the southern part is known as the brown tract region with which the whole wilderness by some is confused but with no more accuracy than any one county might be said to comprise an entire state indeed brown's tract is the least interesting portion of the adirondack region it lacks the lofty mountain scenery the intricate meshwork of lakes and the wild grandeur of the country to the north it is the lowland district comparatively tame and uninviting not until you reach the rockette do you get a glimpse of the magnificent scenery which makes this wilderness to rival switzerland there on the very ridge board of the vast watershed which slopes northward to the st lawrence eastward to the hudson and southward to the mohawk you can enter upon a voyage the like of which it is safe to say the world does not anywhere else furnish for hundreds of miles i have boated up and down that wilderness going ashore only to carry around a fall or cross some narrow ridge dividing the otherwise connected lakes for weeks i have paddled my cedar shell in all directions swinging northerly into the st regis chain westward nearly to potsdam southerly to the black river country and from thence penetrated to that almost unvisited region the south branch without seeing a face but my guides and the entire circuit it must be remembered was through a wilderness yet to echo to the lumberman's axe it is estimated that a thousand lakes many yet unvisited lie embedded in this vast forest of pine and hemlock from the summit of a mountain two years ago i counted as seen by my naked eye forty-four lakes gleaming amid the depths of the wilderness like gems of purest ray amid the folds of emerald-colored velvet last summer i met a gentleman on the raquette who had just received a letter from a brother in switzerland an artist by profession in which he said that quote, having travelled all over switzerland and the rhine and rhone region he had not met with scenery which judged from a purely artistic point of view combined so many beauties in connection with such grandeur as the lakes mountains and forests of the adirondack region presented to the gazer's eye End quote. and yet thousands are in europe to-day as tourists who never gave a passing thought to this marvellous country lying as it were at their very doors another reason why i visit the adirondacks and urge others to do so is because i deem the excursion eminently adapted to restore impaired health indeed it is marvellous what benefit physically is often derived from a trip of a few weeks to these woods to such as are afflicted with that dire parent of ills dyspepsia or have lurking in their system consumptive tendencies i most earnestly recommend a month's experience among the pines 
the air which you there inhale is such as can be found only in high mountainous regions pure rarefied and bracing the amount of venison steak a consumptive will consume after a week's residence in that appetizing atmosphere is a subject of daily and increasing wonder i have known delicate ladies and fragile schoolgirls to whom all food at home was distasteful and eating a pure matter of duty average a gain of a pound per day for the round trip this is no exaggeration as some who will read these lines know the spruce hemlock balsam and pine which largely compose this wilderness yield upon the air and especially at night all their curative qualities many a night have i laid down upon my bed of balsam boughs and been lulled to sleep by the murmur of waters and the low sighing melody of the pines while the air was laden with the mingled perfume of cedar of balsam and the water lily not a few far advanced in that dread disease consumption have found in this wilderness renewal of life and health i recall a young man the son of wealthy parents in new york who lay dying in that great city attended as he was by the best skill that money could secure a friend calling upon him one day chanced to speak of the adirondacks and that many had found help from a trip to their region from that moment he pined for the woods he insisted on what his family called his insane idea that the mountain air and the aroma of the forest would cure him it was his daily request and entreaty that he might go at last his parents consented the more readily because the physicians assured them that their son's recovery was impossible and his death a mere matter of time they started with him for the north in search of life when he arrived at the point where he was to meet his guide he was too reduced to walk the guide seeing his condition refused to take him into the woods fearing as he plainly expressed it that he would die on his hands at last another guide was prevailed upon to serve him not so much for the money as he afterwards told me but because he pitied the young man and felt that one so near death as he was should be gratified even in his whims the boat was half filled with cedar pine and balsam boughs and the young man carried in the arms of his guide from the house was laid at full length upon them the camp utensils were put at one end the guide seated himself at the other and the little boat passed with the living and the dying down the lake and was lost to the group watching them amid the islands to the south this was in early june the first week the guide carried the young man on his back over all the portages lifting him in and out of the boat as he might a child but the healing properties of the balsam and pine which were his bed by day and night began to exert their power awake or asleep he inhaled their fragrance their pungent and healing odors penetrated his diseased and irritated lungs the second day out his cough was less sharp and painful at the end of the first week he could walk by leaning on the paddle the second week he needed no support the third week the cough ceased entirely from that time he improved with wonderful rapidity he went in the first of june carried in the arms of his guide the second week of november he came out bronzed as an indian and as hardy in five months he had gained sixty-five pounds of flesh and flesh too well packed on as they say in the woods coming out he carried the boat over all portages the very same over which a few months before the guide had carried him and pulled as strong an oar as any amateur in the wilderness his meeting with his family i leave the reader to imagine the wilderness received him almost a corpse it returned him to his home and the world as happy and healthy a man as ever bivouacked under its pines this i am aware is an extreme case and as such may seem exaggerated but it is not i might instance many other cases which if less startling are equally corroborative of the general statement there is one sitting near me as i write the color of whose cheeks and the clear brightness of whose eyes 
cause my heart to go out in ceaseless gratitude to the woods amid which she found that health and strength of which they are the proof and sign for five summers have we visited the wilderness from four to seven weeks each year we have breathed the breath of the mountains bathed in the waters which sleep at their base and made our couch at night of moss and balsam boughs beneath the whispering trees i feel therefore that i am able to speak from experience touching this matter and i believe that all things being considered no portion of our country surpasses if indeed any equals in health-giving qualities the adirondack wilderness end of why i go to the wilderness wilderness by carl sandberg this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org there is a wolf in me fangs pointed for tearing gashes a red tongue for raw meat, and the hot lapping of blood. I keep this wolf because the wilderness gave it to me, and the wilderness will not let it go. There is a fox in me, a silver-gray fox. I sniff and guess. I pick things out of the wind and air. I nose in the dark night and take sleepers and eat them and hide the feathers. I circle and loop and double cross. There is a hog in me, a snout and a belly, a machinery for eating and grunting, a machinery for sleeping satisfied in the sun. I got this too from the wilderness and the wilderness will not let it go. There is a fish in me. I know I came from salt-blue water gates. I scurried with shoals of herring. I blew water spouts with porpoises. Before land was, before the water went down, before Noah, before the first chapter of Genesis. There is a baboon in me, clambering clawed, dog-faced, yawping a galoot's hunger, hairy under the armpits. Here are the hawk-eyed, hankering men. Here are the blonde and blue-eyed women. Here they hide, curled asleep, waiting, ready to snarl and kill, ready to sing and give milk, waiting. I keep the baboon because the wilderness says so. There is an eagle in me and a mockingbird, and the eagle flies among the rocky mountains of my dreams and fights among the Sierra crags of what I want. And the mockingbird warbles in the early forenoon before the dew is gone, warbles in the underbrush of my Chattanoogas of hope, gushes over the blue Ozark foothills of my wishes. And I got the eagle and the mockingbird from the wilderness. Oh, I got a zoo. I got a menagerie inside my ribs, under my bony head, under my red valve heart. And I got something else. It is a man-child heart, a woman-child heart. It is a father and mother and lover. It came from God knows where. It is going to God knows where. For I am the keeper of the zoo. I say yes and no. I sing and kill and work. I am a pal of the world. I came from the wilderness. 
End of Wilderness by Carl Sandburg. The Wild Northland, Chapter 5, by William Francis Butler. Coffee Break Collection 32, Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Wild Northland, Chapter 5. The Forks of the Saskatchewan, a perverse parallel, Diplomatic bungling, its results. Two hundred and fifty feet above water level, the narrow tongue of land rises over the junction of the two Saskatchewan rivers. Bare and level at top, its scarped front descends like a wall to the rivers. But landslip and the water of time have carried down to a lower level the loose sand and earth of the plateau, and thickly clustering along the northern face, pines, birch, and poplar shroud the steep descent it is difficult to imagine a wilder scene than that which lay beneath this projecting point from northwest and from southwest two broad rivers roll their waters into one common channel two rivers deep furrowed below the prairie level curving in great bends through tree fringed valleys one river has traveled through eight hundred miles of rich rolling landscape the other has run its course of nine hundred through waste and arid solitudes. Both have had their sources in mountain summits where the avalanche thundered forth to solitude the tidings of their birth. And here at this point, like two lives, which coming from a distance are drawn together by some mysterious sympathy and blended into one, are henceforth to know only the final separation. These rivers roll their currents into one majestic stream, which sinking into a deep gorge, sweeps eastward through unbroken pine forest as yet no steamboat furrows the deep water no whistle breaks the sleeping echoes of these grim scarped shores the winding stream rests in voiceless solitude and the summer sun goes down beyond silent river reaches gleaming upon a virgin land standing at this junction of the two saskatchewan rivers the traveller sees to the north and east the dark ranks of the great sub-arctic forest while to the south and west begin the endless prairies of the middle continent it is not a bad position from whence to glance at the vast region known to us as british north america when the fatal error at saratoga had made room for diplomats of old and new england and removed the arbitrament of rebellion from the campaign to the council those who drew on the part of great britain the boundary lines of her transatlantic empire bungled even more conspicuously in the treaty chamber then her generals had failed in the field. Geographical knowledge appears ever to have been deemed superfluous to those whose business it was to shape the destinies of our colonial dominions. And if something more tangible than report be true, it is not many months since the British members at a celebrated conference stared blankly at each other when the free navigation of a river of more than 2,000 miles in length was mooted at the council board. But then what statesman has leisure to master such trifles as the existence of the great river Yukon, amid the more important brain toil of framing rabbit laws, defining compound householders, and solving other equally momentous questions of our imperial and parochial politics? However, to our subject, when in 1783 the great quarrel between Britain and her colonies was finally adjusted, the northern boundary of the United States was to follow the 49th parallel of latitude from the northwest angle of the Lake of the Woods to the River Mississippi, and thence down that river, etc., etc. Nothing could possibly have been more simple. A child might comprehend it. But, unfortunately, it fell out in course of time that the 49th parallel was one of very considerable latitude indeed, not at all a parallel of diplomatic respectability, or one that could be depended on, for neither at one end or the other could it be induced to approach the northwest angle of the Lake of the Woods or the River Mississippi. Do all the sextant or quadrant or zenith telescope could, the 49th parallel would not come to terms. Doggedly and determinedly, it kept its own course, and utterly regardless of bigwig or diplomatic fogey, it formed an offensive and defensive alliance 
with the sun and the pole star two equally obstinate and bigwig disrespectful bodies and struck out for itself an independent line beyond the mississippi there lay a vast region a region where now millions soon to be tens of millions draw from the prairie and river flat the long sleeping richness of the soil then it was a great wilderness over which the dusky bison and his wilder master roamed in that fierce freedom which civilization ends for ever to the bigwigs set the council board this region was a myth a land so far beyond the confines of diplomatic geography that its very existence was questioned not so to the shrewd solicitor admiral auctioneer general conveyancer and jack of all trades in one who guided the foreign policy of the united states unencumbered by the trappings of diplomatic tradition he saw vaguely perhaps but still with prescient knowledge the empire which it was possible to build in that western wild and as every shifting scene in the outside world's politics called up some new occasion for boundary rearrangement or treaty rectification he grasped eagerly at a fresh foothold an additional scrap of territory in that land which was to him an unborn empire to us a half-begotten wilderness louisiana purchased from napoleon for a trifle became in his hands a region larger than european russia and the vast watershed of the missouri passed to into the empire of the united states cut off from the mississippi isolated from the missouri the unlucky boundary traversed an arid waste until it terminated at the rocky mountains long before a citizen of the united states had crossed the missouri canadian explorers had reached the rocky mountains and penetrated through their fastness to the pacific the british and canadian fur traders had grown old in their forts across the continent before lewis and clark the pioneers of american exploration had passed the missouri discovered by a british sailor explored by british subjects it might well have been supposed that the great region along the pacific slope known to us as oregon belonged indisputably to england but at some new treaty rectification the old story was once more repeated and the unlucky forty-ninth parallel again selected to carry across the mountains to the pacific ocean the same record of british bungling and american astuteness which the atlantic had witnessed sixty years earlier on the rugged estuary of the st croix for the present our business lies only with that portion of british territory east of the rocky mountains and between them the bay of hudson and the arctic ocean from the base of the great range of the rocky mountains the continent of british america slopes towards the north and east until unbroken by one mountain summit but in a profound and lasting desolation it dips its shaggy arms and ice-bound capes into the sea as drear and desolate two great rivers following of necessity this depression shed their waters into the bay of hudson one is the saskatchewan of which we have already spoken the other that river known by various names english because the english traders first entered the country by it beaver from the numbers of that animal trapped along it in olden time churchill because a fort of that name stands at its estuary and missinippi or much water by the wild races who dwell upon it the first river has a total length of one thousand seven hundred miles the last runs its course through worthless forest and primeval rock for one thousand two hundred miles end of the wild northland chapter five